thanks everyone who is uh, watching us today um, this uh, late time, early time in the morning. So my name is David Mohaisen. I'm a fellow professor at the University of Central Florida in the United States. And uh, this work is joint uh, with my ex-PhD student, uh, Marwan uh, Omar. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about this very uh, small idea, which is looking into the impact of uh, um, model drift on <clears throat> the accuracy of natural language processing uh, models, particularly a case study of hate speech detection. And this work is funded by NRF, the National Research Foundation of South Korea. And so um, uh, here are the outlines of uh, my talk. I will have an introduction, that is an overview, algorithms and evaluation metrics, and results and conclusion. And so let's start with the introduction. So as we all know, deep uh, neural network uh, models, DNNs, um, are uh, machine learning algorithms, advanced ones that utilize neural networks and have been very uh, you know, successful in achieving very uh, high results in uh, multiple tasks, particularly in natural language processing, where the goal is to uh, allow computers to understand uh, human languages. And uh, those, as we all know, have been uh, also shown to be, while, while they are, um, have been improving accuracy over the recent a few years, thanks to the DNNs, uh, they have been also uh, shown to be vulnerable to adversarial examples. Um, another element of the background is his speech detection. His speech detection is one uh, uh, such uh, natural language processing techniques uh, that have been also shown to be vulnerable to uh, such adversaries. And in his speech detection, the goal is um, uh, to uh, classify um, 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 different inputs of uh, language utterances, such as sentences, uh, to indicate whether they are hit speech or not. And so, um, in particular, for um, say hit speech diction, uh, um, or you know, in general, in sentiments, um, the uh, goal is to for adversary is to perturb input data to produce incorrect predictions. And uh, that is going to be slow, some slightly different uh, form of correctly classified inputs. And so, in the example that we have here, the original uh, utterance is a perfect uh, uh, performance by the actor, uh, which is, um, according to our uh, um, um, algorithm, is shown to be positive with 99% accuracy. Uh, the adversarial uh, modification of it is going to be by changing the word uh, perfect, for instance, into spotless uh, performance uh, by the actor. And that is uh, often classified into negative. And so uh, to address this issue, uh, what we do is that we want to incorporate uh, sometimes the uh, spotless uh, uh, word as an interesting example into the training process. And this is what's called adversarial training. And so it is a defense mechanism to diversify machine learning algorithms uh, or models in general uh, uh, from AEs. And the training uh, the model uh, on, on both the original and the adversarial example so that the model itself is aware of the adversarial example. So some issues with for example, include that machine learning algorithms uh, evolve over time uh, with the new training data. And this training data will address uh, what we call constant drift prediction accuracy can it change over time. And so to improve the accuracy, again, you need to incorporate new training data in the model uh, to address it. However, it's not really well understood how adversarial training uh, be uh, as effective uh, under this uh, natural evolution due to the uh, retraining of the model. And so there's such a question that we pose in this uh, small work is a model training is updated upon uh, adversarial training. Uh, however, how much of the adversarial training is remembered in the model? And so uh, we start with a few data sets that we collect from uh, Hagel, Irony, Hate, Offensive. Those are uh, three uh, data sets that are used in um, 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 hate speech section. Uh, one of them, uh, all of them are from Twitter. And uh, they all uh, look into uh, uh, irony uh, language, hate language, and offensive language with different sizes. Again, they are from Kaggle and they are available online. And so as far as, as algorithms that we use to license this idea, uh, we use uh, BERT, uh, which is a prediction and core representation from transformers, a uh, very uh, popular uh, type of uh, neural network with uh, attention, and it has perfect fit for various natural language processing tasks. Roberta is an improvement, improvement over uh, BERT, and uh, uh, Synerge is uh, a system that is built particularly for speech detection, extrapolating on Roberta. Uh, for our evaluation, we use accuracy, and accuracy is going to be the number of correct sentiments uh, predictions made by the model, uh, normalized by the total number of predictions. And so the procedure that we follow for our evaluation is we train a model for hate speech detection. Uh, we spare 20% of the data for drift uh, evaluation. This is what we're going to be eventually using. And introduce adversarial examples to look into the accuracy. And then introduce adversarial training and look into the accuracy. Hopefully, that will be improving the detection of adversarial examples by adversarial training. 
and what that is the basic logic. And then we introduce a tra retraining of the model to measure the impact on initial uh, training. And so here are the results uh, quickly. And so we look into uh, the classification accuracy with our set of examples. And as we look here, we find that uh, different models perform differently, although we are able to achieve something above 80%, generally speaking. With BERT achieving, in the case of irony, uh, well, because certainly BERT is performing the best, but in the case of irony, BERT providing 93% of accuracy, almost 93% of accuracy, um, with uh, the head that is performing 89% of accuracy, and with the fin set uh, achieving 90 uh, or almost 91% of accuracy. So this is a great, this is like the premise of uh, hate speech detection using natural language, uh, uh, deep learning algorithms with natural language processing. Uh, and as we introduce um, uh, examples uh, and look into detection of shared examples using the same idea that we initially, uh, initially described of just manipulation of simple words, what we have found is that the accuracy of those algorithms uh, decrease significantly, which is not surprising really, it's just intuitive. However, what is not intuitive is that significant reduction in accuracy where you are only able to detect about uh, 12 percent, uh, 12.6 percent of, or 13 percent of the official examples in irony, about 13 percent in the case of uh, a head deficit, and 8 percent in the case of offensive deficit using uh, BERT, which is the best performing algorithm in all cases. Okay, so moving forward, what we look into is also uh, improving the, these, these classifiers using um, uh, official training. And so uh, naturally, you will not be able to achieve the same accuracy that you have achieved initially without the official examples. Uh, we, we were able to achieve with BERT, for example, 78%, which is uh, quite higher than 13%, uh, but not as high as 90% in the original model. So to demonstrate the idea that we have, uh, we look into classification accuracy under industrial training with model retraining. So that is like, you know, moving from the left side to the right side. And so what we have found is that the impact of uh, retraining the model has somewhat an analogous impact as in uh, adversarial examples. And so what we have found is that the model has forgotten uh, what it has learned about uh, the different uh, uh, elements of um, uh, offensive language in hate and offensive, achieving only an accuracy of 21 or 22 percent in the case of BERT uh, uh, for the hate and uh, 17 percent in the case of uh, BERT for the offensive. So, in conclusion, we look into the effect of cell examples, misclassification rate with a cell example is significantly high, and to address that, we do a cell training. However, a cell training has certain uh, limitations that we demonstrate in this uh, workshop paper. Uh, it's limited effect on NLP models uh, robustness. The concept of phenomena addresses by model uh, retraining um, is uh, something that not being, being paid attention to and shell training significantly degrades uh, over time as we have said it here. Uh, we look forward in the future into uh, developing some techniques that will address uh, this issue uh, through uh, expanding bandwidth of uh, a model, capacity of a model, uh, as well as spearing out uh, the training of the actual examples. So with this, I'll wrap up and um, um, I would be very happy to answer any questions. If not, feel free to follow up with me uh, over email. Uh, the email is provided in the paper. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for your presentations. So now I wonder if any participant has questions on this paper? Okay, let me um, uh, take a, a quick questions. Um, in the paper, uh, in your, your presentation, you, you mentioned that there could be some concept of data drifts uh, happen um, in the data. So uh, I wonder the degree of shifted chip data because uh, um, maybe the light, uh, a, sl a slight um, concept drift or heavy concept drift would significantly, significantly uh, affect uh, whether the model remember or uh, what uh, what degree of the retraining need to be conducted? Yeah, it's a very good question. So uh, as far as the problem that we are addressing here is concerned, uh, the uh, drift does not have to be very significant in the data so that you can actually affect the uh, memory of the model uh, with respect to the actual examples. Uh, for instance, as we know, actual examples are only marginal uh, examples with respect to the model, with the, uh, respect to the model of parameters. And so if you have a very small change in the input data, you have to modify your hyperparameters in a way to classify them correctly. And if you're not paying attention to the actual examples as a first class citizen, uh, then you will be able to skew the performance of uh, the algorithms uh, to, uh, against, against uh, those, those examples. Now, quantifying the drift in the data itself is very interesting. Although uh, in our work, uh, we're not concerned ourselves with it. It's just any small uh, change in the uh, uh, input data. 
uh, would significantly impact the ability of the model to uh, detect, to, to, to maintain a good detection of RCL examples. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your answering. Now, uh, given the time constraints, um, uh, maybe now uh, we need to move to the next presentations. Uh, how about uh, we we can can we directly let the, the, uh, Professor David uh, Mahansen to continue his uh, second presentation? Uh, the second presentation is by my student, so Jabbar. Jabbar, do you want to share your screen and go ahead? Uh, yes, sure. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. So, can I uh, share my slides? Yes. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Abdurrahman. Uh, I am a PhD uh, candidate at the University of Central Florida. And today I'll be presenting our work uh, titled Measuring the Privacy Dimension of Free Content Websites Through Automated the Privacy Policy Analysis and Notation. And uh, the work is supported by NRF and SAC. So the uh, outline of my presentation will be as follows. Uh, I will start with the uh, introduction. I will introduce the topic of free content websites and the uh, importance of uh, privacy uh, policy analysis. Then I'll provide a, an overview of our data set collection and representation. Next, I will present uh, our pipeline for privacy policy analysis and notation. I will then move to presenting our uh, main results and discussion. And finally, I will provide a, a, a brief summary of our main uh, contribution. So in terms of uh, web services types and for the purpose of uh, this work, uh, we have divided the web services into uh, two uh, main categories based on their uh, profit model, the free content websites and the premium websites. Uh, we define the free content as any website that provide uh, physical or virtual services free of charge. And some of those websites run on donation or revenue from advertisement. The, uh, the other is the premium group, which contains the websites that provide content using uh, subscription uh, uh, subscription based or uh, pay as you use model and and uh, as we are uh, studying the privacy policies in this work uh, we can define them as the primary channel for uh, where the service providers they inform their users about their data collection and use uh, and typically the uh, data practices are embedded within these uh, privacy policies and they reflect the service provider behavior and security concerns. Uh, in this work, we, we are studying the differences uh, in data collection and sharing between the free and premium websites. And uh, toward these objectives, we uh, have collected more than uh, 1,500 websites that offer free and premium content and the websites uh, were obtained from the top search results of uh, three uh, search engines, uh, Google, uh, DuckDuckGo, and uh, Bing. And when selecting the uh, websites, we considered the most popular ones that provide uh, free or paid uh, content. We uh, then uh, manually examined and labeled each website to a free or premium category. And also we uh, categorized them manually into five groups based on the content they provide, either books, uh, games, movies, music, or software. And to understand the privacy policy reporting for free and premium content websites, we crawled uh, those websites to obt obtain their privacy policies. Uh, we also manually verified the validity of each extracted policy for accurate uh, reporting of the observation and findings. And uh, in line with the literature, we applied the following nine uh, categories, the uh, first party collection, third party sharing, uh, user choice, uh, user access, data retention, data security, privacy change, uh, do not track and specific uh, audience. And we used uh, the, these high level categories as labels. And um, we, uh, we applied our uh, uh, previously implemented annotator that we called uh, the TLDR to extract the uh, reporting practices of the free and premium uh, uh, websites that we have collected. And in order to build our annot uh, annotation pipeline, uh, we started with crawling the uh, compiled online websites and then extracted their privacy policies. 
within pre-processed uh, pre each privacy policy to extract the uh, paragraphs or the segments. And then the TLTR uh, annotator take place uh, by classifying or associating each paragraph to one or more uh, privacy category. Uh, and in the next slide, I, I, I will discuss the pipeline uh, design of TLDR annotator. And uh, after experimenting uh, several uh, configuration, we demonstrated the capabilities of a uh, pair transformer and the uh, model uh, combined with the word piece as um, uh, for the word representation. Um, and we, uh, and we, uh, uh, we, we, after applying the uh, uh, word base as a word representation, we use the, uh, the, the TLDR uh, annotator for uh, the segment annotation. And then the annotator will output a, a binary decision for each segment, for each category, as a positive or negative. And the positive outcome will indicate that a segment contains information about the target category. Uh, whereas uh, the negative outcome uh, indicates that Sigma does not contain such uh, information. In our experimental setup, we trained the proposed pipeline using the uh, OBB115 dataset, which contains uh, 115 privacy policies uh, manually annotated by 10 uh, Laos uh, school students. We used the uh, decrement level splitting approach where the model is trained on 18% uh, of the privacy policies and tested uh, against the remaining 20%. Um, and for our evaluation metrics, we used uh, the uh, F1 score. Here uh, we have the performance of our uh, proposed classifier and using the best uh, performing uh, word representation and learning algorithms with uh, 91 uh, overall F1 score and the highest uh, a difference is in the data retention category with uh, 87 uh, F1 score. Um, and using the implemented annotator, we uh, study the uh, privacy uh, policy reporting uh, frequency for both the free and premium uh, content websites. And uh, the, tab the, uh, the table here shows the percentage of websites uh, containing information regarding each privacy policy category. And our findings shows that uh, in general, premium websites are more likely to uh, report uh, their data collection and sharing practices, uh, despite the fact that uh, free content websites having uh, longer uh, privacy policies. Uh, moreover, we noticed that free content paragraphs are uh, less likely to contain useful information regarding the data collection practices. And this will indicate that premium websites are more to, to the point while uh, the ambiguity rules the free content websites, in particular for the uh, first party uh, use category. In addition, uh, we explored the privacy policies uh, similarity among our data set. Uh, using the TFIDF and cosine similarity, we extracted the similarity between um, uh, the uh, privacy policies and we note that free content websites are more uh, likely to have similar privacy policies, indicating a potential usage of generic templates among those uh, websites. Um, our findings shows that uh, premium websites are uh, more transpa transparent and to the point in reporting their data sharing and user, uh, user tracking practices. Um, moreover, the, uh, the lack of uh, transparency in free content websites are concerning uh, in contrast to the uh, premium content where uh, free, uh, free, free websites contain less information as they are hiding the potential risk of using their services. And among other findings, we uncover that uh, free content are more likely to use uh, generic privacy policies templates. And this indicate that privacy policy may not uh, reflect the actual data collection practices uh, used by the uh, website service uh, providers. And to summarize this work, we study the free and premium content websites reporting privacy practices and covering the lack of reporting and, and of data collection in free content, in addition to using uh, general templates, which calls for uh, further investigation. Um, with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your listening, and uh, I'm happy to answer any question. Okay, thanks for your presentations. Now uh, we can take a few questions. Any participant has question for this talk? You can, um, participants can put their questions in the chat. Yeah, you can leave your comment or questions. Uh, 
in the chat or just um, um, speak yourself. Okay, let me um, have a, a very quick, quick questions. I just wonder that uh, uh, the reason you choose BERT uh, to do the uh, privacy annotations, and uh, I also wonder that uh, how do you set the training of BERT? Is it trained from scratch or trained from any pre-trained BERT model? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, actually, uh, the reason uh, for selecting the BERT is, that's, uh, is the same like uh, uh, is part of the second part of the question, which is uh, BERT is a pre-trained actually model and uh, is print like pre-trained on uh, uh, a huge um, uh, 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 amount of text. So uh, we we uh, we use uh, the uh, BERT uh, and we also we we just like fine tune the model using the uh, the uh, the small uh, data set that we have from the privacy policies and they are all text. Uh, it is a kind of like a text uh, classification task. So uh, the uh, the birth model is pre-trained, but we fine tune it with the uh, data set that we have, the uh, OPB 115, uh, which contains the 115 privacy policies. We uh, to fine tune the model, and uh, we tried other models. And with the with birth model, actually, we have the uh, best uh, uh, performance results. Okay, okay, I got it. Okay, thanks for your answering. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, now we need to move to the next presentations. Um, based on the original orders, um, uh, now we need to invite uh, the papers, uh, Kahen, Knowledge Aware Hierarchical Attention Network for Fake News Detection on Social Media. I find that it seems one of the uh, authors here um, is the author here. Uh, Hui Guo, Yang, Yang Hui Guo, are you here now for the presentation? Uh, yes. Okay, now please uh, share your screen for the presentation. Okay, thank you. Yes, I can see your screen. Please go ahead. Um. Hello everyone, my name is Hui Guo Yang. I'm from National Yangming Jiao Tong University in Xinzhu, Taiwan. The title of my topic is Kahan, a Knowledge Aware Hierarchical Attention Network for Fake News Detection on Social Media. Um, here is the outline of my presentation. Uh, to begin with, Fake news is so rampant, it can bring social unrest. Therefore, uh, detecting it on social media is very urgent. And there are many fact-checking websites in the world that involve a lot of human beings to check the truth of news stories. Uh, they often check the sources of the news story, who the author was, the publishing date and the time, the names and the places mentioned in the news story, and so on but it takes a lot of time and a lot of human efforts. Therefore, if we could automate the whole checking process, uh, we could largely enhance the efficiency in uh, debunk debunking the fake news. Although the fake news is written deliberately to mislead people, yet the public's reaction that came from their discernment of news stories can more or less reflect the truth behind them. The challenge is that those user comments are mostly anonymous and noisy. So we would like to resort to external knowledge as a means to support our model design. For example, here, we would like to scan the news text to identify any proper noun, which we call them entity mentions. And we would like to discover any other keyword, which we call them entity claims in a description linked to the entity mentions through external knowledge. Uh, we anticipate the inclusion of entity claims from external knowledge would help to learn better representation of news stories, as well as user opinions for fake news detection. The other challenge is that the user's responses flow over time 
As we can see, people's focuses toward a new story change as time flows. If we can also capture these temporal features, it would help a lot for fake news detection using users' comments. The inputs of our problem are news content, user comments, and we do some pre-processing of the news content to obtain entity and entity claims. Our model would then output either fake or real as a label to a given input. Uh, this is the, the overview of our model. There are four parts. Next, we will introduce each part of our model. First, we introduce how we use uh, external knowledge to obtain entity claim. For example, suppose we have identified an entity, an entity mentioned BBC from news text from the knowledge graph of Wikipedia. Every one hop node from BBC, which are bounded within the yellow box is the entity claim of our interest. We then get the embeddings of both entities and entity claims by Wikipedia to VEC. We take average over entity claims to represent the context of the entity and then combine them together to obtain knowledge vector. In the world level of news content encoding, we use bi-directional GRU to encode words and the additive attention to obtain the sentence representation. We design a news toward entity attention and use scaled dot product attention to learn the re relevance of the external knowledge with the news. Then we fuse external knowledge vector with our sentence vector and they run through another bi-directional GRU and additive attention to update the news content representation with external knowledge. Uh, next, to capture the temporal characteristics of user comments, we introduce the concept of sub-event, which represents a group of user comments at different moments. But how do we decide the start and the end of a sub-event? Previous methods use count-based sub-event division, which might cut off the later posted comments and ignore their temporal characteristics. We propose time-based sub-event division to uniformly collect posts from the whole time span, such that we can encode user comments in every time interval. For example, uh, for example Suppose the total time span is uh, say 100 hours and we want to have five sub-events. Sub so we may set our initial time interval as 20 hours and then try to collect posted comments from, uh, to form a sub-event in these intervals. If there are only four intervals in which we have collected enough comments, then we need to have the interval and check if there is new interval with non-empty comments. Uh, we keep this process to add new sub-event until we get the target number of sub-events. Then uh, we stop and output the sub-events. Uh, we use uh, another bidirectional GRU to encode words and posts and attention mechanism. Uh, like news content, we also design the comments towards entity attention. We then combine knowledge vector and sub-event vector and get the common representation. Uh, in the end, we combine news representation and the common representation to get an overall representation R and train a binary classifier. The training objective is cross entropy loss function with L2 regularization. Uh, here we report our experiments. Our benchmark is fake news net, which is collected from two fact checking websites. 
Politi Fact and the Gossip Cup. Uh, there are 318 fact news in Politi Fact and 4,227 in Gossip Cup. We have filtered out news data with less than three comments. Um, there are three baselines. Um, the first is HPA BLSTN, and then DEFEND and CAN. We use the HPA BLSTN, which is a variant of HSA BLSTN as our baseline, because we only use post text features for social attention. Uh, in both data sets, our uh, method can perform um, outperform three baselines in nearly all metrics. Uh, we then report our Appalachian study. For the first Appalachian study, we test how news content encoding and the user comments encoding each affect the performance. Uh, we can observe that in both data sets, considering only news content encoding, which are the leftmost columns in both data sets performed the worst. The performance increased largely when considering both news content and the user comments. For the second Appalachian study, we study how external knowledge affect the performance. Uh, we can observe that removing external knowledge from news content suffers the most. This means the relevance of the external knowledge with the news content is higher than that with user comments. Uh, moreover, the influence of external knowledge on political fact uh, is more obvious than in Gossip Cup uh, due to their ga gaps in the number of entities and the diversities in coverage of domains and categories. Uh, we also examine our type-based sub-event division algorithm and compare with count-based algorithm. First, we e evaluate the number of sub-events and their performance, and our type-based algorithm performed better in most cases in PolitiFact. Uh, in Gossip Cup, we could achieve comparable performance with count-based algorithm. We also compare the number of comments needed for detecting fake news. And the results show that uh, Kahan needs fewer comments in any setting of the number of sub-events, which demonstrate the efficiency of Kahan in temporal information utilization. Uh, in conclusion, our model is able to encode news content user comments and to integrate it external knowledge through attentions. In addition, our time-based sub-event division algorithm can effectively and efficiently use less user comments to detect fake news. Uh, the experiments have shown that our model has a promising pro performance. We have also done application study to verify the effectiveness of our model design. Thank you so much for your attention and I welcome any question. Okay, thanks for your presentations. Now we can um, take a few questions. Any participants have questions, please leave a comment on the chat or just speak yourself. Okay, I would like to have a question for your presentations. Um, uh, for my knowledge is um, you will method is uh, mainly uh, based on the uh, extract entities that you use in uh, Wikipedia to vector to uh, have the embeddings for the entities, then the entity embedding are used to uh, as the input of your model. Um, I just wonder that uh, why don't you have a end-to-end -end training to directly uh, obtain the entity embeddings and have it trained together for the fake news detection, why don't you uh, consider it as a two-stage model uh, instead of an end-to-end -end setting? Uh, the second uh, is that, have you ever 
compare your method with any of existing method on knowledge graph aware like new citation method? This is two of my questions. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, for the first questions, um, um, our, our choice of choosing the Wikipedia to VEC um, as the embedding for the external knowledge is, um, is mainly um, due to the, uh, our, the, uh, the total time taken to um, perform our ex experiments. And uh, as uh, since uh, retrain a uh, uh, knowledge embedding uh, uh, using uh, limited um, data set um, uh, does, doesn't have a good uh, performance. But uh, if you take into a more data set to, uh, for training, um, uh, currently we, we are not able to train in a very efficient way and it may might take a, uh, a lot of time and we we hope that our research uh, focuses mainly on the effects that in uh, the, the the effects of in uh, incorporating the external knowledge and uh, uh, in our um, future plan we would like to um, extend our current research to the end to end scenario and uh, for the second okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, for a second question uh, sorry yes uh, for Please. second question um, um, currently we we um, do not compare with uh, any knowledge graph based approach on, on, um, with our model yet we but we also um, put that in the future, future plan um, to extend our study, to uh, extend our research work. Thank you for your question. Okay, thanks for your answering. And also thanks for your uh, presentations. Uh, now we need to move to the uh, next uh, presentations. Um, actually, we have a question from the chat. Um... Okay, so yeah, I now, I am aware of that questions. Uh, okay, given uh, we have uh, some time constraints, maybe the author or the presenters would like to answer the questions in the chat. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> okay, now uh, we have the, I suppose we have, we still have one um, presenters online here. Um, now, uh, how about we can learn the present for the papers on uh, Huxley's and the uh, hidden uh, agendas, a Twitter uh, conspiracy uh, theory state has it. I, I think that the, maybe the author, Samantha Phillips, uh, is here. I, uh, yes, Samantha, I am. Are you here? Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So please go ahead and share your screen for the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, I can see your screen. Great. So hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Phillips. I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon working with Dr. Kathleen Carley. And today I'm going to be talking about a, a data set paper I worked on with Lynette Ung and Kathleen Carley entitled Hoaxes and Hidden Agendas, a Twitter Conspiracy Theory Data Set. Can everyone see when I went to my next slide? I just want yes. to confirm. All right, great. So first, a definition. What are conspiracy theories? They're unsubstantiated narratives designed to explain significant social or political events with secret plots by malicious and powerful actors. So right off the bat, this definition is very much up to interpretation, and that's part of why conspiracy theory detection, um, particularly online, is so challenging. More broadly, the motivation for curating this data set is that we want to be able to understand and track these online discussions containing conspiracy theories, in particular due to offline consequences 
uh, of these theories. And I provided a few examples, including physical violence. An example of that would be Pizzagate. So during the 2016 US presidential election, there was a theory that Hillary Clinton and other uh, Democratic Party operatives were running a child sex trafficking ring out of a pizza shop in DC. And this eventually results resulted in shots being fired at the pizza shop um, by people trying to, quote, save the children. Um, additionally, loss in trust in public health messaging. I'm sure we can all think of many, many examples um, related to uh, COVID, but I'll provide one. So COVID vaccines are a ploy to insert people with microchips. Uh, that conspiracy theory might lead somebody to not uh, go ahead and get vaccinated. Um, and then also perceived illegitimacy of elections is another example. So we can think about the role of messaging from QAnon um, in the events following the 2020 presidential election. So regardless of if these theories are being shared um, in, a, in an effort to educate others or to, uh, sorry, someone just under the waiting room. Um, to educate others or to um, actually cause discourse, they are a form of misinformation. So we, we are responding to this sort of greater call to publish data to contribute against the fight against misinformation online like we are all here uh, to do. So in terms of the data set annotation, so for each tweet, we first screened out tweets that are not in English language or uh, contained insufficient text. So maybe just, just a URL. Uh, once we removed those tweets, which was in total about 320, we then annotated if the tweet contained or referenced a conspiracy theory or not. And you'll note that about 75% of our data set uh, was labeled to contain a conspiracy theory. This, of course, is, of course, is not reflective of the broader Twitter landscape or infoscape. This is the way that we collected our data, which uh, I will also describe. And then just for tweets that do contain a conspiracy theory, we annotate the stance towards that conspiracy theory. So supportive, neutral, or against. Um, so ultimately we are publishing a data set of tweets of 3,100 tweets, um, all in English and containing uh, sufficient text. There are four topics in this, in this conspiracy theory data set, um, each collected separately from, again, Twitter. Uh, first is climate change. So an example climate change conspiracy theory tweet is, I have zero obligation to entertain climate change denials. It's the equivalent of flat earth theorists. So clearly um, climate change denying and flat earth are two conspiracy theories referenced, um, but this stance of this tweet is against those conspiracy theories. Uh, then we also have COVID-19 origins. So an example tweet is hashtag scandemic, plandemic, COVID genocide, don't get fooled, these people didn't die from hashtag COVID-19. So this would be an example of a tweet that's supportive towards the uh, reference conspiracy theory. Next, we have COVID-19 vaccine. And just to note, we did find that the sort of ideas and terms uh, used to reference different uh, COVID-19 origin and then vaccine conspiracy theories differed enough that it did warrant these two separate categories. But an example tweet is Bill Gates, hashtag coronavirus vaccine, or biological weapon and implanted microchip. So this is an example of a tweet with a neutral stance towards this reference conspiracy theory of uh, the vaccine being a biological weapon um, designed to implant microchips in people. Finally, uh, I collected data uh, right around the time of the Ghislaine Maxwell trial about uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And so one example tweet is my elderly aunt watching at CBS Evening News commenting, someone killed that guy. She's not even on Twitter. She's not on Twitter and even she knows hashtag Epstein didn't kill himself. So this is of course another example of a tweet that's supportive towards a conspiracy theory. So how can you use this data set? Well, you can detect the following across domains or topics on social media. So first, conspiracy theory or not. Uh, second is stance. And then, of course, the topic of the conspiracy theory. Um, and the four topics, again, are climate change, COVID-19 origins and vaccine um, and Epstein. And we do exactly that uh, to show how this data set can be used. So first, starting from our corpora of 3,100 tweets, we perform a binary classification 
um, for each tweet. Is it a conspiracy theory or not? If it's if it is, which is about 2,400 uh, tweets out of the total 3,100, then just that subset of 2,400 uh, tweets that do contain a conspiracy theory are used for experiments two and three, um, which is stance and topic of conspiracy theory. So in terms of results, um, this is for experiment one, conspiracy theory detection. As expected, the neural net classifiers that we did, Bert, Albert, Roberta, Distilbert, which are Albert, Roberta, and Distilbert are sort of uh, following Bert, um, designed to optimize Bert in, in various ways from adding more training data to paring down the number of parameters. Um, but anyway, so as expected, these neural net classifiers outperform the baseline, which is just a majority class classifier um, across the board, which uh, sort of highlights the importance of these contextualized text embeddings. Another thing I do want to note is that uh, DeSilbert took about the third of the time of Roberta, holding all other factors constant, um, as constant as we could, um, with only a drop of macro of one squared of 0 0.009. So depending on uh, sort of the goals of the person using this data set, um, these the additional parameters and training data used in Roberta that is not in Distilbert uh, may not be necessary. Um, and then I also have the performance of Roberta by class. It uh, performed best for the conspiracy theory class, which is the majority class. Next, for the stance detection experiment, the best performing model was BERT using macro F1. Um, and BERT performed best for the support class, which again is the majority. And then again, I'm just highlighting that the still BERT took about the half of the time of BERT and resulted in a, in a macro F1 score drop of less than 0.1. Then for experiment three, topic detection, the best performing model was Roberta and the best, uh, Roberta performed best for the Epstein-Maxwell topic. Um, and so we see that the performance for this experiment in particular is very high. Uh, and that's probably due to the distinct keywords or language used to refer to each uh, to conspiracy theories in each domain. And these large language models are great at memorizing these key uh, language characteristics. So to conclude, kind of a wordy slide, but um, we have we're publishing this data set that will be publicly available. Um, allowing researchers to study the dynamics of online discussions containing misinformation, particularly conspiracy theories, what sets it apart. It contains multiple topics not limited to COVID-19, um, as well as this manually labeled stance uh, towards the reference conspiracy theory. And uh, we report that the performance of the neural net classifiers across all three experiments um, using the macro F1 is 0.75 plus or minus 0.19. Um, so we're inferring that we probably don't need a huge data set of annotated data to effectively be able to identify these conspiracy theories, stances, um, and or topics. Um, and this could be due to common text structures among conspiracy theories. Um, that's something I'm really interested in looking into further is different linguistic properties um, of these messages. And then just a note on limitations, conspiracy theories evolve very rapidly and they often contradict each other. People, for example, people simultaneously believe that Princess Diana faked her own death and also was murdered. Um, and so the list of conspiracies collected in this work is by no means exhaustive. Um, so thank you so much for listening to me today. Um, if you are using this data set um, or have any questions, please, uh, I'm the corresponding author. I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks for uh, your presentations. Now um, we can take a few questions. Um, uh, is any participant has question here? Uh, you can leave the question on the com on the chat or just uh, speak yourself. Sure. Um, yes, thanks uh, for the great talk, uh, Samantha. Just quick questions. Yes. Did you look at the medieval COVID-19 um, data set and, uh, and task that was organized uh, uh, last November? Um, because they also publish a large data set of tweets with nine, uh, all related to COVID-19, related to nine mm -hmm. conspiracy theories. And there were uh, seven, eight teams in the world which have competed to best uh, uh, detect whether the tweets uh, do mention one of those conspiracy theories or support or 
um, are unrelated to those conspiracy theories. And there was a lot of, uh, because each tweet can mention multiple conspiracy theories. So there was yeah. like a, a multi-label, multi-classification problem. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to ask whether your data sets compare uh, with this one, um, what's what's the overlap, uh, this sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that I, I'm definitely aware aware of that task, but we did I did not do any further sort of uh, direct comparison other than um, the very surface level different uh, topics being looked at. Um, but I do think that it's really valuable that they kind of deep dove into the COVID nineteen conspiracy theories, um, and that would be something I should definitely uh, look into. So thank you. Thanks. Okay. So um, given we have time constraints, uh, we uh, thanks again uh, for the Minstar's presentation. Thank you. Okay, now um, we still have two uh, speaker, but uh, um, it seems that um, Two of our script speakers uh, cannot show up here uh, due to their time zone constraint. So uh, we now will uh, play their pre record video. Uh, so um, please uh, help uh, play the pre record video. Thank you. Uh, can you all see the screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Um, try the first video. Oh. Can you all hear it? Now we, I can just see your screen, but I cannot hear any oh. or see any pre cool video. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, you can't hear it, you said? No, I can see the video. I cannot oh. see the video, yeah. Oh, you cannot see the video, oh. Yeah. Let's try it again, sorry. Oh. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, yes, now I can see you can uh, help play. Thank you. Okay, let me know if you can hear it or not. Yeah, yeah I, it seems I can hear the, the voice, but um, the voice is quite small. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Is that better? Yeah, yeah better, but uh, with a uh, very loud uh, noise. Sorry, yeah, what? Maybe, um, maybe you can try again, but but uh, I just. Um, uh, no, no, I, I think uh, the, 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 the sound was too loud. I think you need to change your setting on Zoom and say same as system or for the sound. OK. Um... Okay, here we go. Okay, let me know if we are, sorry, let us repeat that. I am Arkadit Tade from okay. the Department of Perfect. Artificial Intelligence at Indian Sounds Institute good. of Technology yeah, Hyderabad, yeah. along with Dr. Monendra Sankar Desarkar from Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology Hyderabad. I am the co-author of our research paper multi-context based neural approach for COVID-19 fitness detection. I am glad to present our work at the 10th International Workshop on Natural Language Processing for Social Media or Social NLP. These are the table of contents. First of all, we are going to talk about the introduction, the data set that we have used, then the methodology that we have taken, some quantitative and qualitative results, and then future works. So first of all, what is fake news? It is a claim or information that has been verified to be false or not true. There can be different types of fake news. 
from political aspect, from entertainment aspect, or from COVID-19 based aspect, which is very uh, problematic in our day-to-day -day life. So with the introduction of freedom of speech, every user can post everything on social media without any restrictions. And there is very less community guidelines for such cases. So that's why it is very easy to spread false inf information due to lack of monitoring organizations, as well as strict or rigorous guidelines. The rapid spread of COVID-19 related misinformation can lead to several problems. For example, misreporting of ground truths, wrong measurements, unproven medications that have resulted in attacks on specific communities, mob lynching, hoarding of medicines and medicinal aids, and etc. So with that problems in mind, we are going to take up the objective of developing an expert neural system to be able to detect fake news in COVID-19 situation from social media posts. The data set that we have used is COVID-19 fake news data set, which is a very bench, important benchmark data set. It is a collection of 10,000 tweets that has been collected using Twitter API. The sources are different government accounts, medical institute new, uh, channels, World Health Organization, CDC, and different kind of Indian medical organizations. Further, they have been fact verified using PolitiFact, Snoops, and blooms blooms live etc and were annotated as real or fake news afterwards they have been also annotated using a additional step of human evaluation as we can see here there is a table of examples and the right hand side we can see the split of the data which is more or less equal in real and fake scenarios or it is a properly balanced data set the methodology that we have used, first of all, we are going to talk about the differences that we have done with respect to the contemporary related works. First of all, we know that most of the fake news detection systems are single context based in nature. That means they only focus on specific aspects of language constructs, for example, syntactic structures, semantic structures, the content, but none of them looks exactly all of them at a particular time. Secondly, most of the systems right now try to be more general. For example, they try to contain, contain multiple domains, entertainment, sports, business, politics, celebrity, and all that. But what we are trying to do is that we are trying to create an expert system that is specialized on COVID-19 fake news detection. So our model or our architecture is different and novel in two, two perspectives. It is multi-context. That means it takes into account different structures of the content, the syntactic structure, the semantic structure, the structure specific to social media posts, and language-specific features, which can be general language-specific features as well as structural language-specific features for tweets. And lastly, representation averaging of multiple transformer-based representations from different aspects. We use BERT as our backbone architecture, which is a 12 layered encoder decoder representation architecture. It has self attention, residual connections, and feed forward network for each and every transformer for each and every encoder decoder block. The input of this architecture is a tokenized sentence having CLS token or class token appended at the front and separation token appended at the back. It also offers two kinds of representations output which is pulled representation, which is taken out from the CLS representation and token-wise representation, which is obtained from each and every token at the output layer. The MICNA architecture or multi-context neural architecture is our proposed architecture, which is comprising of three different transformer-based components, the BERT base, which takes, which uses English corpus, the COVID Twitter BERT, which uses COVID-19 related tweets, and lastly, the bar tweet, which has been trained on general tweets. Each of these MICNA components a specialized unit, as we have talked about. Lastly, we introduce representation averaging, which takes the output of these three individual contents, and these latent representations are then averaged to a final 768 dimensional representation. Lastly, the classification layer uses this multi-context representation to do the final classification of the output. Here are some quantitative results. First of all, we compare our MICNA architecture with some baselines that were introduced by the authors. 
as we can see from this table, the MICNA architecture, both in the development set, that is in the validation set and the test set, has significantly outperformed the baselines that were introduced by the authors of the data set that we have used. Also, it's, it is noted, it should be noted that precision recall and weighted F1 score is also far, far ahead rather than the baselines. Secondly, the quantitative results with respect to state-of-the-art machine learning architectures that have been used on this particular data set are also compared. As we can see, most, all of this com contemporary state-of-the-art architecture has been beaten by our MICNA architecture, both in the dev set, that is in the validation set, and in the test set by superior margins. It should be also noted that prior knowledge injection, which means Apart from the training of architecture, different knowledge bases has been used for training the model and heuristic based decision making. This kind of processes has been also beaten by our MICNA architecture. We have also conducted several ablation studies to understand if these components that we have used to build the MICNA are really needed or not. For example, as we can see here, we have used the individual components as well as we as well as we have used different combinations of the uh, of the components. Finally, we see that all of these components are very necessary for achieving the state of the art results in the data set, as well as in efficient detection of fake news with respect to social media content in COVID-19 situation. We also do some qualitative results analysis. We also answer some crucial questions. Some of the questions we highlight here, for example, we ask that if fake news related to COVID-19 surround some specific named entities or not, for that reason, we churn most, request named, most frequent named entities for predicted fake tweets as well as for real tweets. And we see that Trump, India, China, Donald, Yuhan, these kind of corresponding named entities are mostly surrounded in fake tweets which leads us to the observation that mostly this kind of fake tweets contain more political results, political information rather than the actual COVID-19 situation facts. The other question that we try to answer here is that is our model really efficient rather than the other architectures that we have used as a component? The answer is yes. What we do is that for each of this individual component, we also classify using this individual component that is BERT, BERTWIT, and COVID City BERT. And lastly, we use our model to get the final representation using TSNE plots. As we can see from these TSNE plots, our MICNA architecture is a clear winner, having a big separation with respect to the real tweets and the fake tweets, which gives us the impression that MICNA architecture is comprised of different important components that are all of them are needed. Extending the MICNA architecture for multilingual corpora in different languages is our next task, as well as this particular architecture has been used only on textual features, but moving forward in future, we would like to accommodate acoustic features, image features, video features, gesture and postures. Here are some references. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for help create the uh, previous videos. Um, the author has a uh, statement in the message that uh, if any participant has questions, please uh, feel free to email uh, him. Uh, he will be very happy to uh, answer and reply your questions. Thank you. Now, uh, we still have the last presentations. Um, basically, could, would you please help create the last video? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you. My name is Selim Sazid. I'll be presenting my paper, Influence of Language Proficiency on the Readability of Review Text and Transformer-Based Models for Determining Language Proficiency. Thank you for watching my presentation. This study performs linguistic analysis of English reviews written by non-native English speakers of various English language proficiency groups. As a most popular universal language, the prevalence of English written by non-native English speakers are vastly available 
uh, on web and in social media. For example, among the 1.5 billion people use English, only 400 million use English as a first language, while the remaining 1 billion are non-native English speakers. Analyzing the linguistic characteristics of textual content written by uh, these non-native English speakers has significance for various tasks, such as forensic linguistic, author profiling, and authorship identification. The goal of this study is to explore the relationship between the readability of the text and the English language proficiency level of the non-native English reviewers. Besides, this study tries to determine the language proficiency groups of the reviewers from the social media review text. The main contributions of this study can be summarized as follows. Here, a social media corpus of around 1,000 reviews written by uh, non-native English speakers of various language proficiency levels are created, and this corpus has been made publicly available for the researchers. The readability scores of the reviews of various uh, language proficiency groups are compared to find any differences. And finally, a number of traditional ML classifiers and transformer-based uh, language models are fine-tuned for automatic categorization of the reviews into various uh, language proficiency groups. In this study, we consider five English language proficiency groups. The groups are selected based on the categorization of EF Education First Organization, which is a English language training organization, based on their uh, categorization. The high, very high proficiency group represent users who are capable of using nuanced and appropriate language in social situation and can read advanced text with ease. The high proficiency group that represent people of uh, who can understand TV shows or who can present uh, their work or can read newspaper. The moderate proficiency group represent people who can participate in meeting in one's areas of expertise, can understand song lyrics and can write professional emails. The low proficiency groups, people are capable of navigating in an English-speaking country. They can, and, uh, they can engage in small talk with the colleagues and can understand simple emails. The very low proficiency group represent people who can only introduce themselves, can understand simple signs, and only can give a uh, basic direction to a foreign visitor. The restaurant reviews are manually collected from the TripAdvisor website. TripAdvisor is a popular travel website that contains thousands of reviews of various restaurants across the world. Here, we select one country for each of the ELP group. For example, Finland represents very high proficiency English uh, group. Kenya represents high proficiency group. China represent moderate proficiency group, Bangladesh and Myanmar represent low proficiency and very low proficiency groups respectively. And the number of samples of each uh, groups are shown in the table. All of the groups contains around 200 reviews. This study considers various user attributes such as city, country, name and profile pictures which are collected from the uh, TripAdvisor website. Since this study depends on the accurate annotation for various ELP groups, we try to make sure the data annotation process is accurate. For example, uh, there could be tourists who write review uh, for the particular restaurant. By considering all the attributes like city, country, name, and profile picture can help to distinguish or uh, discard those reviews. Here are the examples of reviews written by users representing various language proficiency groups. Uh, from the examples, uh, it can be seen uh, there are some complex uh, sentence structures and words in the very high proficiency group, while 
in the low proficiency and very low proficiency groups users tend to use simple and common english word and uh, simple structures in this study we consider two readability tests flesh reading is and flesh can get great test both indicate how an english passage is easy to read the formula for both tests are shown in the slide both consider the total number of words the total number of sentences and total number of syllables however different words are used for each of the formula the fre and fkg are universally related that means a high score in fre generally means a low score in fke however a direct conversion is not possible between these two tests The tables show the FRE and FKE readability scores of five language proficiency groups. As we can see, all the ELP groups show similar mean FRE scores, which is around 70. The interpretation table suggests that reviews written by all the ELP groups represent plain English and fairly easy to understood by 30 to 15 years old student. Similarly, FK score indicate the reviews can be understood by grades 6 level students. To categorize the reviews into various language proficiency group, we consider four classical machine learning classifiers, logistic regression support vector machine, random forest and k-nearest neighbor. For the uh, classical ML classifier, we consider unigram and biogram based TF, IDF scores which are used as the input for the ML classifiers. For the uh, classical ML classifiers, the default parameter settings of the scikit-learn library are used. We also consider class balanced weight. For the KNN, the value of the K is set to 5. To assess the performance of various classifiers, we consider tenfold cross-validation. In addition, we employed to transform our best pretend language models BART and Roberta. Here are the results of various classifiers. From the table we can see uh, there, are no, there are not noticeable differences between uh, the traditional ML classifier and transform our best models. The best classical ML classifiers uh, logistic regression and SPM yield an F1 score of around 0.75, while uh, transformer based Bart and Robert uh, uh, provide 0.77 F1 scores. The experimental results suggest that the readability test are not good indicator of the language proficiency levels. The readability tests do not consider the types of word used or the sentence structure. They only consider the number of words of sentences or syllables. Thus, they cannot capture uh, the differences between uh, various language proficiency groups. The result also indicate that there may exist some differences in engram based features in various ELP groups. Uh, besides, existence of some country specific features may positively influence the results. The future work will focus on increasing the corpus size. As a preliminary study, here we only use a small number of samples. Uh, we also plan to include reviews from multiple countries to each ELP group. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you for all Hello. of your participations. This is the last presentation that pre recorded by the authors. If you have any questions on this talk, uh, please feel free to email the message to the authors. Thank you. Now, um, we have end the uh, morning sessions of Social NLP Workshop, uh, but uh, please do remember that uh, we will have the uh, two keynote speeches uh, in the afternoon sessions uh, start from uh, at 20s uh, uh, in the time zone of CEST. So please do remember to participate in the keynote speech in the afternoon. Thank you. So uh, this is the end of the morning sessions of Social Energy Workshop.
Today, uh, the Social NLP workshop will have two keynote speakers. And uh, the first keynote speaker is Professor Kai Shu. Uh, professor Kai Shu is now an associate, uh, assistant professor at Inino Institute of Technology. And uh, uh, the expertise of Professor Shu uh, include uh, machine learning and uh, especially on social media analysis. The, the most well-known research direction of Professor Shu is at uh, come back uh, about this information, including fake news, uh, fake messaging that are widely spread on social media. And Professor uh, Shu is also now, uh, uh, given his uh, biography, is now a panelist uh, at the first uh, global uh, WHO infodemic, uh, infodemic conference. And uh, I believe uh, Professor Shu uh, will give a very uh, insightful uh, talk on uh, fighting against uh, disinformation. Let's uh, welcome Professor Su's uh, keynote speech. Professor Su, please uh, go ahead and share your screen. Thanks, Chantal, for the introduction. Um, uh, I hope I can do that, uh, have an insightful talk. So let me try to share my screen. Okay, let's see. Uh, can you see my screen or let me try again? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Now I can you see, can see the slides. Yeah. Oh, well, let me try again. Um, you can try again. How about now? I would make it bigger, maybe. Is it okay? Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah. Um, okay. So, first of all, thank uh, Chengzhe for the introduction. And uh, it is my great pleasure to be here and to give the talk at this very prestigious workshop. Um, so today I will talk about um, combating disinformation on social media and its challenges. So first of all, maybe a very general introduction of my recent research. Um, you know, in general, my research focusing on uh, developing novel machine learning and data, data mining algorithms to derive actionable insights uh, from noisy, heterogeneous, and linked social media data. Um, you know, first, you know, we know that social media data is often very uh, high dimensional and noisy. So I developed a feature representation learning methods to handle complex social media data. And second, uh, you know, in social media, it's easy to collect um, social networks uh, with millions of even bigger number of users that provide opportunities for network analysis. So I focusing on modeling different types of networks. Third, you know, one goal of studying social media, which is actually one theme of this social NLP workshop is that we try to understand social behaviors and provide better services to users. So I work on different applications to use AI for social problems. And today my, my topic will be focusing on uh, disinformation detection on social media. Okay, so I want to start with this uh, actually not that recent post from Forbes about 10 wonderful examples of using AI for good. Uh, you know, actually spotting fake news is um, actually one of them has attracted a lot of uh, attention in both academia and industry and is among one of these uh, 10 very important problems. But however, you know, fake news is not a new problem, um, you know, it's detrimental effects are amplified by the use of social media. So social media becomes a popular means for information sharing because of its easy access, because of its low cost, because if it's very easy to got a wide spreading. Uh, and the number of users use social media is increasing a lot, as you can see on the uh, uh, bottom left figure. And, and a recent post uh, from Pew Research Center uh, shows that you know, about half of the Americans get news on social media, at least sometimes, and still around 67% of Americans they get news on social media in 2021. Okay, so it's a lot uh, uh, of people. Well, you know, social media is like a double-edged sword. Um, it's some, it also enables the widespread of uh, disinformation, including fake news. Uh, sometimes we say disinformation is uh, false information with a bad intention that aims to mislead readers. 
right? And, and fake news is often treated as one typical example of disinformation, um, indicating that the news is intentionally false. And disinformation is rampant on social media uh, in recent years. For example, as you can see, uh, study shows that COVID-19 disinformation has been widely spread and causing an infodemic issue. Um, in addition to that, fake news can be very diverse in terms of topics and domains. Uh, you know, as you can see from the right figure that it across politics, urgent, uh, urban engine, business, entertainment, and so on. So um, this is what we can observe from, from the current state of fake news. Well, a natural question is why we need to study fake news and disinformation. Um, you know, from a psychology point of view, uh, humans are very susceptible to fake news uh, because we have, oftentimes we have very limited resources, uh, we have very limited time, we have very limited information, and we often have very limited expertise um, in specific domain, right? And humans are biased uh, by nature, okay? So for example, the confirmation bias um, theory shows that people uh, tend to believe information when it confirms their existing knowledge, no matter it's fake or real, right? Um, in addition to that, uh, fake news can have detrimental society effects. Um, it can mislead people to false information. Uh, it will change the way people respond to true news because people cannot differentiate whether it's true or not. So they just, can, they just say, hey, I don't believe anything uh, on the internet, right? And they even weaken the public trust. In, in governments and journalism. So uh, that, that's a very serious problem. So then why fake news detection is a such a challenging problem, you may ask, right? Um, so first of all, it is not like a, another competition. Um, you know, and in a typical competition, you, you just uh, uh, collect some data sets and then you build some machine learning algorithm and then see uh, who can have the best performance. But Fake news detection is, is way more complex than that uh, in, in many dimensions. So today I will mainly talking about some impervasive challenges, including uh, detection challenge, explainable challenge, and data challenge, and then adaptation challenge. Okay, so next I will introduce some of my uh, uh, recent representative research on fake news detection for solving these challenges. And first of all, when we have enough data um, of labeled news and social engagements, how can we detect fake news effectively with social context? Okay. And then second, uh, to involve and benefit domain experts, such as uh, fact checkers, journalists, uh, how can we make the fake news detection results more re uh, expandable? Third, you know, social context um, may be helpful uh, to detect fake news, but it usually takes a long time to aggregate, right? And, and can we detect fake news at an early stage? And, and how early can it be? And at last, fake news detectors trained in one domain may not work in some new domains. So how can we learn domain adaptive fake news detection? Okay, so next I will first introduce how to leverage social context to detect fake news, uh, which is published in Wisdom 2019. Okay. So, um, you know, since fake news is often intentionally written uh, to mislead the users by mimicking real news, uh, it is difficult to differentiate fake news from real news using only the content of the news. Okay. So the social context can provide some useful auxiliary information beyond the news contents. Uh, to leverage this social context, we aim to answer these following questions. First, what are the key actors and their relations in social context? And how can we model social context to help detect fake news? So this is a, a typical news ecosystem, as you can see on the figure on, on the right. Uh, usually in this news ecosystem, we, we have three major entities, okay? We have the publishers, news pieces, and the users. Um, so the publishers obviously are those who publish the news, 
uh, it can be some you know news agencies or can be some uh, uh, you know Twitter users, right? And it's news pieces are uh, those pieces spread on social media uh, and the users who are engaging with those uh, news news pieces. Okay, and among these three entities, uh, we can have three major uh, relations. So the first relation is we call uh, publishing relations, indicating the relations between the publishers and news. Um, as you can see, for example, here we have publisher P1 publishes news A1 and A2, and A1 is a piece of fake news and A2 is a piece of true news, right? And we also have spreading relations. Spreading relations is between the news and the users, indicating which user is, has spread which piece of news. And social relations is commonly observed in social networks, right? For example, in Twitter, we have the follower information and followee information. So, um, so to, to summarize, we have the three major relations. So the goal of this work is we try to learn from these um, uh, this heterogeneous networks um, that contains these entities and relations to detect fake news. So how can we do that? Uh, you know, we try to learn a news representation from this heterogeneous network uh, to detect fake news. Essentially, we try to propose a, a joint embedded framework that um, can simultaneously learn the representation from news contents and the social context through a matrix factorization approach. Uh, you know, I will not go through the details of this approach, but you know, essentially this approach contains three, the following uh, major components. The first one is for the news content embedding. Uh, you know, it learns the news representation by factorizing the bag of word matrix. For example, here we have this X is the bag of word matrix, and then we can factorize it into two low dimensional matrix, including D and V, and then we, we use D as a representation of the news, okay? And then social context embedding, you know, includes three parts. Um, the user user embedding tries to learn the relation um, from the social relation, as we just described in the earlier slide. Uh, we have also have this user news embedding and the publisher news embedding. Essentially, we take the relation as a matrix, and then we factorize this matrix in a proper way, and then try to jointly learn uh, the representation of the news through this joint learning process. Okay, and then we, of course, uh, obviously we have a fake news classifier as defined here, which is a linear function. Uh, try to map the representation of the news to the final uh, label of the news. Okay, so this is the overall uh, framework that we uh, we have built. You know, back in that time, uh, this paper was published in 2019. Back in that time, there's actually no existing data sets, uh, or I would say no existing comprehensive data set uh, that can be used for fake news detection, which contains both you know news contents, social context, and, and, and other information. So we initiate this process to create a uh, or construct a new data set called Fake News Net. Uh, this is a data repository, contains fake news pieces from different domains, uh, including politics, entertainment, and COVID-19, and so on. Okay. So in this, as you can see from this table, uh, comparing with existing data sets, uh, actually the Fake News Net contains, you know, the kind of most comprehensive dimension of information and it is publicly available online. As you, you can see from here, there's a GitHub link, okay? So based on these data sets, uh, now we are trying to answer, uh, we'll try to answer the following evaluation questions. So first is we want, want to understand whether the proposed model can really improve the performance of fake news detection. And then we also have uh, conducted some ablation study to understand whether each component of our model is important or not. So as you can see from these uh, two figures, uh, essentially we show that uh, the proposed model can achieve the state-of-the-art performance. And uh, you know, we also show that the different types of relations it, are also very important to improve the fake news. For example, if you can look at this figure on the bottom right, uh, we have this tri-FN, which, which is our model, and then we consider the different variants of, of this model. For example, we consider Try fn slash p, meaning that we don't consider the publisher relation, and then we can see there's a decrease of the performance, and try fn slash s, meaning that we do not consider the spreading relation. So there's a further decrease, right? So basically, we have through this study we show that um, social context, especially this multi-dimension, 
of such a context is very important and they contain uh, complementary information, okay? So by the way, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, I would be happy to, to answer that, okay? Okay, great. To summarize this, this work, you know, essentially we show that social context information brings additional signals to fake news detection uh, in addition to the news content, right? And we show that it is very important to capture the relations among different actors, among these publishers, news pieces and users to uh, detect fake news. And the proposed framework is effective uh, to model the trial relation through heterogeneous network, okay? Yes, um, good. Um, so for domain experts, um, as I said, such as journalists, these news publishers or fact checkers uh, or NGOs, uh, you know, who care about this very important problem, how, how can they benefit from a you know, automatic and successful fake news detection? So can we make this new fake news detector more explainable or more understandable, right? Um, so next, I will introduce um, a piece of work called Explainable Fake News Detection, which was uh, published in KD uh, 2019. So the goal of explainable fake news detection is to detect fake news and explain why it is detected as fake, okay? But you may ask, why we should care about explanation? Uh, you know, because explanation can provide insights and knowledge to domain experts, right? And certainly if we can, uh, if we can extract explainable features from this noisy social media data, then we can further improve the performance of fake news detection, okay? So, you know, since the user express their opinions and the feedback to news, usually through comments uh, on social media. So in this work, we focusing on the following two questions. First is, would the comments be helpful to explain and detect fake news? and how to model this content and the comment relations um, for expandable fake news detection. Okay. So think about in a, in a real world uh, scenario, uh, this news contents and, and the user comments, they are oftentimes uh, inherently correlated and they can provide important cues to explain why a piece of news is fake. Um, first, you know, news sentences, they often contain false claims. And some of them can be real, some of them can be fake. So in that sense that we want to find those sentences, those news sentences, they are more likely to be fake. And obviously they are more checkworthy for those fact checkers, right? Uh, in addition to that, uh, user comments. Uh, on social media, such as the, the comments on Twitter, um, they actually provide information such as the user's opinions to the news, the user's sentiment to the news, the user's stance to the news. So for example, as you can see in this figure, uh, we can see that users on the right side, they uh, discuss different aspects of, of the news, such as the first comment saying that, you know, president does not have the power uh, to give citizenship, okay? And actually this comment is directly corresponding to the news sentence on the left, uh, which states that, uh, you know, uh, this president granted the US citizenship to 2,500 Iranians, okay? So as you can see, these comments can uh, provide some additional information to explain why the news sentence on the left is, is fake, okay? So this is a very, uh, uh, this is very typical in social media, actually. So to model uh, these relations, as we just described between the news sentences and the comments, okay? So we propose a model called the DEFEND, uh, which can uh, e explain why a, a news is detected as fake. And it essentially contains uh, the following components. The first component is to try to learn the representation 
from uh, for the new species through these hierarchical attention networks because you know oftentimes in, in, uh, a news piece is a long document and it contains the sequence of sentences and each sentence is each, each sentence is essentially a sequence of words right so we can we would uh, that's why we use this hierarchical attention network to learn representation and second uh, you no know, comments uh, may contain useful semantic information to help detect fake news so we encode the comments through a word level attention network. After we obtain the representation of both sentences and comments separately, then we propose a, a co-attention network to combine them together and try to model their correlations. And finally, we uh, propose to use a, uh, class, a fake news classifier to predict fake news, okay? So, after we train this model, then how can we obtain this explainable uh, information? So what we do is we use the attention weights. As you can see here, uh, we have this S and C, you know, uh, as shown before we do the co-attention, um, we combine them together and then we will have a, a weight associated with each piece of news sentence and each uh, is common. And then we use that as, as a way to measure the explainable degree. Uh, oh, now I see some question. Is there any way slide? Yeah, okay, okay, good. So yeah, feel free to ask questions and I can uh, answer uh, your questions anytime, okay? So basically this is the overall uh, uh, you know, overview of our framework. Okay, so we first evaluate um, this model about whether it can detect fake news effectively. Uh, we compare with our model DEFEND with several state-of-the-art baselines, as you can see on the, on the table. Um, uh, actually, these baselines fall into different categories, right? We, 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 we compare with baselines that only consider news contents, only consider news, user comments, and then some of them consider both. And we can observe that uh, essentially, in general, these methods uh, modeling both the comments and the contents, they can achieve uh, better for performance than those methods who only use news sentence, uh, news content or user comments, okay? And then overall, our method can uh, achieve the uh, uh, best performance in terms of both uh, accuracy and, and F1, okay? Good. And then second evaluation is about explanation. Uh, you know, we want to know whether the explainable sentences and comments derived from our model make sense or not, okay? Um, so we, we do two sides of uh, explanation, uh, explanation evaluation. The first one is of the contents. Uh, we actually compared with this model with HAN and uh, uh, we, we compare with, uh, we use this MAP as the measure uh, to see whether our model can better capture the news sentences that are checkworthy. And we see that our model can have better performance as you can see on the right side, uh, the top right side. And then in terms of comments, uh, we evaluate using the human evaluation. We ask the mechanical interpreters uh, to uh, give their feedback. And uh, we can also see that DEFEND can better discover those expandable comments than the baselines, okay? So to summarize this piece of work, you know, essentially we uh, study a new problem of expandable fake news detection, and we propose a model called DEFEND, uh, which can identify expandable news sentences and user comments uh, for understanding why news is detected as fake. And we show through experiments, we show that uh, DEFEND can achieve the highest accuracy uh, comparing with existing methods, okay? So up to now, uh, we have shown that um, social context is helpful to detect fake news. While enough social context um, information usually takes a long time to aggregate, right? Um, so we want to answer the question like, can we detect fake news at an early stage 
and how early can it be? So next, I will introduce um, early fake news detection. Uh, this piece of work uh, was published in ECML PKDD 2020. So um, other researchers has shown, uh, have shown that uh, fake news can usually sp spread farther, faster, uh, deeper, and more widely than true news in many cases, okay? So, so the goal of this paper is to um, detect fake news uh, effectively, but also at an early stage with very limited annot an annotated data, okay? So think about social media uh, because we have large scale social media data and this data can provide reach, uh, but oftentimes very noisy uh, user engagements, right? Uh, so we, we want to answer this following two questions. First one is, um, would the social engagements or social context be helpful to detect fake news early? And how to learn from this weak social supervision uh, for early fake news detection? So uh, in the real world case, uh, user engagements uh, in social media, they can provide different sources of, of information to derive we call the weak social supervision. So see, you can see this figure as an example uh, regarding the fake news on the left saying, you know, Japanese whaling crew eaten alive by killer whales, uh, 16 dead. So this is a piece of fake news. Um, so as you can see on the right side, we have different users um, providing different comments, right? So for example, the first comment uh, saying that I just don't believe it uh, express a kind of negative sentiment to, to this news. And this in the second one saying can agree, you know, indicating a positive sentiment, okay? In addition to that, uh, users usually have different kind of de uh, different degree of, of bias and credibility. Um, and, and social studies actually have, have indicated that, um, you know, more biased, and the less credible users, they are more likely to indicate this piece of news is fake, okay? So essentially we try to leverage all of these different kinds of signals and oftentimes these signals are weak are not 100% reliable, but sometimes they are useful, right? So we try to leverage all these kinds of signals together and then try to train a fake news uh, classifier, okay? So, more mathematically, or uh, we, our model is really to, to build an effective framework uh, that can leverage this weak social supervision signals uh, from multiple sources to detect fake news. But the challenge is that um, these signals, oftentimes they are intrinsically noisy and, and biased. So the qualities of these weak labels may, may be different. So we propose to jointly learn, you know, the correlations and the distinctions uh, among these clean labels, which is which are obtained from this professional uh, journalism, and these weak labels derived from our uh, social media data. Okay. So what we do is we propose a shared encoder, as you can see on the bottom right of of this slide, uh, to learn the representation for both from uh, from both the clean label data and weekly label data. And then we have separate functions uh, to map the representation to either clean labels and weak labels, okay? So the overall loss function is as shown here is to minimize the prediction error of both clean labeled and weekly labeled data from case sources. So the first turn is the prediction error can be the cross entropy uh, function uh, in the clean data. And the second term is to predict uh, is the prediction error of instances in K sources of weekly labeled data, okay? And then we define a label weighting function um, to control the relative importance of each weak instance, okay? So I see there's a question from Roy as defend utilize multiple attention mechanism is there any recent progress of using transformer-based such as bird model 
Right. So that's a great question, Roy. Thanks very much. Um, yes, uh, I think there are several great work using, you know, we call large language models to detect fake news, such as BERT, GPT-2, or even more recent and larger models to do that. I see um, uh, there's a trend to do that, especially in the NLP community. Uh, and uh, there's, there are actually several interesting work. Uh, people are trying to treat as treat these large language models as kind of fact checkers, because oftentimes uh, the key, the key problem of uh, this, I mean, okay, the, the key uh, uh, step of using these language models is try to learn the knowledge from it. So people say, can we use language models as a fact checkers? So there are several approaches I think proposed from, from Facebook, uh, Facebook research uh, and Microsoft research that are trying to do this. So yeah, I think this, this is def definitely very interesting uh, uh, direction people are trying to do, yes. Good. Uh, and then, so overall regarding about this work, um, yeah, this is essentially what, what, what we are trying to model, okay? And then in the experimental set, uh, evaluation, we um, compare this model with several state-of-the-art uh, early fake news detection methods. Uh, uh, on the right side, we can see this result. Um, we compare with CNN, Convolution New Network, which, you know, consider clean labels, weak labels, or the combination of clean and weak labels. So, you know, uh, uh, please feel free to refer to, to the papers for more details. Um, but a short uh, summarization is we uh, observe that this model um, can achieve uh, better performance consistently in different data sets, okay? And we also see that uh, the model is training on only weak data in general, in, in general performance uh, better than those only look at weak data, okay? And uh, our model, because it considers multiple weak, uh, weak sources, and we try to understand which weak source is, is more important the, than the other. Um, so we can see in this case, in, in this data set specifically, we can see that, um, so this, um, in general, if you consider multiple weak sources, it's better than a single source, but which single source is better, it really depend, depends on the data sets that we have, okay? So to summarize this piece of work, uh, essentially we uh, study a new problem of early fake news detection uh, with we call weak social supervision. And uh, we propose a model, uh, MWSS, which, can, uh, which uh, can jointly learn the little labeled data and multi-source of, of weak labeled data uh, to perform early fake news detection. And we sh empirically show that uh, these different sources of weak social supervision, they contain complementary information. That's why it's very important to consider them together in a reasonable way, okay? Okay, so, <clears throat> um, we have shown that you know we can possibly leverage social context uh, to perform early fake news detection. Um, but sometimes, even though we trained a fake news detector in, in, in one domain, for example, in politics, uh, this fake news detector may contain some kind of bias and may not be generalized to some uh, new domains such as COVID-19 back in maybe two years ago, okay? So next I will introduce our recent work um, on domain adaptive fake news detection, um, which is accepted at the web conference uh, this year. So if you're interested, please feel free to, uh, to check the poster and talk with the, the authors, uh, David. And also if you have questions, feel free to talk to me, okay? Oh, by the way, this is published in 2022, not 2020, so. Good. Okay, so. Um, so as I said, you know, newly emerging domains uh, usually lack of labeled data, right? Uh, to build fake news detection system. I see there's a question here, let me see. Okay, sorry, let's see. 
Emma Jones, is it realistic, practical to collect weak supervision signals for fake news detection? It seems we need much effort to obtain such kind of data. Oh, um, so actually, we all of these weak supervision signals, they are derived from social media data. And, um, you know, actually, currently in the fake news detection community, we have a lot of good data sets. Uh, as I mean, fake news net is one of them. And we have other researchers collected different uh, fake news detection data sets containing social media information as well. Um, so as long as we have these social media data, we can, you know, uh, define weak labeling rules and then apply those rules to the data set and then obtain the weak labels. Okay. But we have to make sure that these weak labels, they are weak, but not useless. So in many cases, we need to, uh, before we, you know, kind of model these weak labels, we have to make sure that these labels, they, um, they can really, for example, achieve some accuracy uh, above random, right? We know that it will not be 100% because it's weak. So we have to make sure that that happens. In terms of effort, um, you know, as I said, we are not requiring you to have such a uh, big amount of social media data for those news you want to check. Um, but we, as long as we have some historical uh, social media data, we can do that. For example, uh, we already collected uh, in this fake news net, we already collected uh, this a lot of social media uh, engagements for this PolitiFact Gossip Cop data sets. But uh, if we want to detect uh, the fake news for some uh, some news that happened today, right? Which we don't have any social media engagement yet. Can we still do that? The answer is yes, because when we do the prediction, we do not need the social media data. As long, uh, we only need the data for training. Okay, so um, that's the short answer. But you know, if you're interested, you can check the details of the of the paper. Okay. And Alex, I may have missed it, but how are you avoiding false positive? where users are claiming that something's fake due to, for example, political allergens uh, through it comes from credible. Yeah, OK. I, I'm assuming you're asking about the Defend paper, which is expandable fake news uh, paper. I think this is, I totally agree with you. I think this is the problem. Um, in, in the Defend paper, we actually did not consider the credibility of the users who post the comments. But which are very important. Okay, so we are, st we are actually working on how to better integrate this user credible, I mean user credibility as some additional signals to rank these comments. Because you know, um, whatever the user said may not be true, even though we rank this as very relevant to the news sentences. But if he or she is a, for example, a bot, a malicious user, so, so we should not try to rely on too much. On these kind of comments to do the, uh, the decision making, right? So I agree with you that we should consider the uh, credibility. But in this piece of work, we haven't considered that. Uh, the goal is really to try to capture the relevance between the sentence and the comments. But yeah, it's definitely worth to uh, was to continue this piece of work by considering the user credibility. Okay, thank you. Okay, going back to this piece of work, uh, you know. Now we're looking at the news pieces from different domains uh, or from different events, okay? So in, this, in, in many cases, existing methods, they are usually domain specific. Uh, they do not explicitly consider uh, this domain discrepancy and they can be biased or overfitting to this specific domain, okay? So this figure gives a, a, a typical uh, cross-domain scenario which we have a source domain, we have a, uh, a, a target domain. Uh, users in the source domain and target domain, they can post comments, they can have different types of engagements, right? But you know, across different these two domains, usually, usually we do not know the, 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 the anchor links of the user, meaning that we do not know which user on the left is corresponding to which user on the right. We don't have this kind of linkage, okay? And second, we obviously we do not have consistent news topics. For example, in the source domain, they're all talking about politics, but in the target domain, they're all talking about COVID-19, for example, okay? So 
So to tackle these challenges, uh, we propose an end-to-end -end reinforcement learning framework um, to detect fake news across domains. Uh, this framework contains two components. The first component is uh, representation learning, as you can see on the left side of this figure. You know, you don't have to um, go through the details of this, but essentially, we're trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, learn the embeddings from three uh, three perspectives. First of all, is we learn the uh, embedding from the comments, and then we learn that from contents, and then uh, we also consider the user news interaction, which essentially uh, contains uh, which user is spreading which piece of news. And then we concatenate them together into an overall representation E prime um, as the representation of, of this piece of news. Okay. And the second component is we call reinforced adaptive fake news detection as shown right side. Essentially, we have this reinforcement learning setting. Um, we take the representation E prime to model it as a state, and then we define a reinforcement learning agent. Um, Essentially, we're trying to use this agent to do two things. Uh, the first one is we consider two types of feedback as a reward. The first type of feedback is we try, we, we want to build a, an accurate fake news classifier, F, right? But we also want to learn, we call it domain variant uh, representation. So we, uh, we define an adversarial, which is essentially a domain classifier. This domain classifier tries to predict whether this piece of news is from the source domain, from target domain. So we integrate these two classifiers, uh, the domain classifier and the fake news classifier together, and then model them as a reward function to, uh, you know, as a feedback to help the representation learning of the, of the, uh, of this piece of news. Okay. So in this way, we will be able to learn a domain variant um, fake uh, domain variant news representation to better detect fake news in the target domain. Okay, so again, this is a newly published paper in this web conference. So we will have a poster uh, in a few days, I guess. So if you are interested, you are uh, feel free to to talk to the authors or me um, for more details. Okay. So in experiments, you know, we we propose this model called real friend. Um, and we compare with this model with uh, several cross-domain uh, fake news testing methods. Uh, I mean, even though we, we didn't find uh, many of them, but we try to adapt some of existing methods to the cross-domain setting, um, as you can see on the, on the table uh, on the right, top right. And we can see that uh, this real FND, a real FND can consistently achieve the best performance than existing methods in terms of different measures such as AUC and F1. Um, and we also do, uh, perform an ablation study um, and we show that this reinforcement learning agent uh, is actually effective to learn these transferable features. Okay, just for example, on the bottom right figure, you know, we have this real fend is, is the first one. And we also derived an variant called a, a adversarial uh, real friend. Essentially, we are not using a reinforcement learning agent. We directly model this domain classifier and fake news classifier as an adversarial type of learning, and then we can see uh, this real friend is better than the adversarial real friend. So it indicates that this real reinforcement agent can better learn a uh, domain variant representation. Okay, and we also show that this auxiliary information such as comments they are they are helpful to detect fake news which is also shown in, in some of the earlier work. Okay. So to summarize this piece of work, uh, we study a domain adaptive fake news detection uh, problem on social media. And this proposed model, which use reinforcement learning for domain adaptation is effective uh, to learn this domain variant representations and auxiliary information from social context is, is helpful. So now I have introduced these four pieces of work. Um, so basically to solve the challenges of detection, explanation, and the data and adaptation, okay? So next I will briefly introduce uh, the lessons learned and some future research uh, directions. Um, 
So first of all, fake new detection is difficult. Um, uh, there are many reasons. Um, for example, it is evolving, um, and the past may not indicate the future, right? Uh, some news may be true, currently can become false in the future. So it is really a moving target, okay? And we know data is, is the key um, it, to, build a, to build effective machine learning algorithms. Uh, but the, the case is we don't really have a large scale number of label data. So how can we tackle this problem, right? And early detection is very important. Um, but data-driven approaches are often limited. So how can we move from data-driven to you know, the theory-driven, or even we try to leverage some ex external knowledge uh, to, to help detection is, is very important, okay? So there's still many uh, open issues for tackling this information on social media, at least just this, some of them. Uh, the first, you know, it would be very important to study this uh, offline impacts of this online information, right? Um, for example, we can study cause analysis uh, to really understand whether this online information causes uh, the real world impact uh, and, and what, in which way and to what degree, okay? And we can estimate the impact of the, this, this information over time and even across different platforms, right? And I would say the build these trustworthy AI tools uh, to com combat this information is also very important. Um, as I have talked with different, uh, different types of uh, organizations, and oftentimes they want to, before they use any tools, they want to really understand it, uh, whether it's reliable, whether they can trust it, and why some kind of um, algorithm makes us such kind of predictions. It's very important to uh, especially for to these uh, downstream decision makers. So we want to increase the uh, uh, explanation ability and transparency of these tools. And we should also consider uh, the potential bias uh, in this disinformation that is target, targeting these minor, uh, minorized or marginalized groups, okay? And, uh, you know, essentially, if you think about combating disinformation, it's really an attack and defense between different uh, actors, right? We're trying to build a, mo uh, a fake news detection model, but some malicious malicious users, they were trying to avoid it. Okay, so how can we uh, consider these more challenging scenarios and build more robust uh, uh, detection tools? Okay, and up to now, most of my, uh, the talk I've, I talked, uh, most of the work I talk about is focusing on text, but actually it can be, uh, the fake news or disinformation can uh, can exist in, in multimodality, right? It can exist in, in images, videos, such as deepfakes, all of this. Um, and then how can we deal with this newly type, new type, newly emerging type of disinformation is, is also very important, okay? Uh, with that, I will thank you all for your attention. And these are some uh, useful links, uh, some books uh, about these topics. We also have tutorials. Uh, they're all public online, um, and uh, we have this COVID-19 related fake news data sets. Uh, uh, feel free to check that out, okay? With that, thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Professor Su's uh, insightful talk. That is truly insightful, and uh, uh, especially for me, uh, for those research, for those people research on uh, disinformation uh, detections. Now uh, we have several minutes. We can um, take some questions. Uh, if any participants have any questions, please just speak yourself, or you can leave your uh, Q question or comment in the chat. It seems we have one questions from uh, the chat. Jacob yeah. and turn it. Yeah. Let me. Okay. Yeah, Jacob. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I think I already answered the question from Alex. Um, I hope you're happy about that. If you still have any follow-up questions, please, please feel free. Uh, for Jack, thanks a lot. Uh, two questions. First one is, um, fake news can be artificially generated uh, while the server training to fool the detection. It seems the current study did not concern about this suspect. Um, can you mention about 
um, AI generated fake news. If, yeah, okay. First one is about, I think, okay. The first one is about the adversarial part of fake news. Yes, as I briefly mentioned in the, in the future work, uh, it is true, I agree with you that um, we should try to increase the robustness of uh, whatever model we design, considering or keep, keep in mind those adversarial uh, uh, agents, right? So um, we, I think there's some ongoing work to try to uh, leverage this adversarial machine learning or security, uh, or AI security methods uh, to, uh, to in inject or encode some kind of adversarial examples uh, in the training data uh, to, to, to kind of uh, explicitly uh, consider this kind of adversarial behavior and try to build more robust model. I think there are some ongoing research to do that. So that's definitely interesting to, to explore. And the second part for your first question is AI generated fake news. Um, yeah, some researchers call this fake news 2.0 uh, because it's machine generated. Uh, and most of the current research on fake news is, is deal dealing with human generated. Um, so machine generated fake news can sometimes have very different characteristics um, uh, than human generated fake news. We do have uh, several studies try to act as an attacker to generate uh, more realistic fake news and try to uh, then defend such kind of AI generated or machine generated. Fake news. So I think we have a, a recent AAA, uh, triple AI paper try to generate to release fake news. Uh, we also have a uh, EM NLP work um, try to you know trace back to understand which uh, which piece of news is generated by which piece of generated model. So if you're interested, please check that out, okay? For your second question, you have demonstrated success, successful cases from different aspects. I wonder what are the common texts that are failed to be detected and why they cannot be detected? Oh, I think this is really, really great question um, about the false positive, essentially, like, in which case this method will fail. Um, as you can see today, I mentioned four pieces of work uh, to tackle this problem from a slightly different perspective, right? Um, you know, we try to look at essentially, if we have a lot of data, how can we better leverage this, this data to detect fake news effectively? And then if we have very limited data available, how can we still build effective model? Um, if we have, some data from uh, the, the, some of the domain that are newly emerging. Can we leverage data from some other domains to you know, have some knowledge to help the current domain? So essentially, um, we're dealing with different scenarios and in, in, which of the, uh, in each of the scenario we have, of course, uh, the failing cases. Uh, some of them is because of, uh, for example, if we build some fake news classifier only trained in political domain, then obviously it will, it's more likely to be, fa uh, to, to be failed in, for example, COVID-19 domains, because this detector is very kind of overfitting to uh, politics, right? So we should, uh, you know, we should uh, be aware of that when we deal with different uh, coerced domain scenario, because in that case, it will be it will more likely to be failed uh, in, in the target domain. So that's just one example. Um, so I think this, this it's kind of, uh, fake news detection is uh, is complicated because of these different dimensions, and uh, we should definitely try to have some, you know, generalized or common benchmark uh, that will facilitate the research of this area. Yes. Um, okay. The site does not seem to lead something. Okay. Fake news tutorial. Okay. I will check about that. Uh, I I thought it will it's it's on it's live, but you know I will. Will refer right. I will. I will check uh, this website and make sure it will be uh, live uh, again. Okay. Thank you, Alex. How do you deal with the case of non-malicious misinformation? Right. Okay. That's a great point. Uh, essentially, this is about uh, you know when we talk about fake news or disinformation, usually we say there are two key aspects. First, the first one is fake news should be fake or should be false. Right. It is false information. Um, and then it should be intentionally spread. And you, 
uh, I would say commonly uh, uh, researchers in this field commonly agree that misinformation usually uh, does not talk about intent. As long as it's false, then it's misinformation. Uh, then this information is more likely to um, talk about those information that is intentionally spread. So the first question from you is really how can we differentiate this or how can we deal with this uh, non-malicious misinformation? So, so to deal with this problem, the key is really to model the intent of the users. And actually, we also had a paper published in web conference this year, okay? We are trying to assess the intent of fake news spreaders. I, I think that's the first piece of work, trying to understand the intent of, this, of, of fake news from a computational perspective. So if you're interested, please check that out. Um, and I, I think you will have some kind of, uh, you know, understanding out of that. Okay. And there are many examples of people sharing um, information from parody. Yeah, I think this is also related to what you're talking about. Um, oh, okay. So let, let's do this one by one. Uh, Jacob, thank for answer. Is there is the detection able to mitigate? No. Um, I would say in some way, but in a very limited way. Uh, so uh, this information detection is, I would say, is the starting point uh, to tackle the disinformation problem. But a more important problem or more challenging problem is really to mitigate or intervene uh, the spreading of disinformation. So um, unfortunately, even though you have 100% accurate fake news detector, still there may be fake news spread on social media because I mean, mostly because um, people, human, they are biased. If I tell you, hey, Jacob, I have 100% accurate fake news classifier, you should believe me. This is fake, this is real, but you may not, okay? It's not because of you, it's because of human. They have confirmation bias. They just want to believe whatever they want. Um, so I would say to mitigate this information, still we have a uh, 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 a lot of research to be done. And I know that researchers from a lot of different disciplines, uh, from social science, from information science, uh, even from you know, HCI, they are all working on this and try to, try to mitigate uh, fake news, okay? Oh, J Alex, you uh, I mean, how can we avoid such as non-malicious, yeah. Um, that's a really challenging question. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, first of all, can we dif really differentiate misinformation from disinformation uh, by computational approach? I don't know, because if, it, if it's not impossible, it will be very hard because the intent of this information is really uh, about, the, about the publishers. Uh, whatever data you collected is, I would say, passively uh, reflect, reflecting um, and this. And we can only try to estimate. That's why, as I said, we have this work to try to estimate the intention. But again, this is the first try. It may not be perfect, but at least we're trying to work on this. Uh, but yeah, I, I, the, the, the true answer is I really, I'm not quite sure about this, uh, you know. But yeah, it's definitely worth to, to study, okay? Yeah, that's all I can see from this chat window. Any any other questions you, you want to ask? Yeah, um, thanks, Professor Su. I, I think that we uh, now are on time for another talk. And uh, if any participant has questions for Professor Su's talk, uh, please feel free to uh, leave your question or comment in the chat. And uh, um, I, I believe that Professor Su will be very happy to uh, answer the questions. Professor Su, uh, thanks again uh, for your uh, great talk. And uh, I would believe we truly learned a lot from uh, your presentation. Thanks for your uh, presentation. Thank you. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you. OK, thank you. Now uh, we will have our second keynote speech. And uh, our uh, second keynote speech uh, uh, speakers will be uh, Professor Tim Asotov. And, uh, Professor uh, Tim Alsop uh, is uh, now at uh, University of Washington, 
and uh, professors uh, teams out of uh, his research expertise is on uh, social media and uh, with the techni technology including uh, data science and uh, machine learning, deep learning, so on and so forth. And uh, uh, based on the show uh, bi biographies, uh, Professor Teams uh, has ever received several uh, top conference awards, including in uh, KDD and so sorry, including the web conference on the force. And today uh, he will give, a, give us a talk about uh, understand analysis and plastic conversations on social media. Let's welcome to uh, Professor Tim Asop's talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, very much for the kind introduction. Can you hear me okay? And can you see the slides okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, uh, first, I want to thank the organizers. Um, I think it's a lot of work to put together a workshop, but it's it's particularly impressive to see one with a 10 year history. And I think that's really incredible. Um, um, I also very much in, enjoyed the previous keynote. It's, it's never easy to follow up on a keynote, but I, I've very uh, much been looking forward uh, to speak to you all. And I, I also enjoyed the, the Q&A both during and after and encourage and, and, and welcome you all to, to keep your questions coming. Uh, I very much look forward to that. All right, um, I want to talk to you about uh, empathy in social media and how we can better understand empathy and how we might even be able to facilitate that. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, everything I'm going to show you is the product of uh, a wonderful team um, uh, from, from both uh, my PhD students, uh, Shi Sharma and Inalin, as well as clinical psychologists at Stanford and, and the University of Washington. And we're very thankful to various organizations uh, that help us do this work. I also do want to start with a content warning before we start. Um, this presentation contains some examples related to suicidal ideation and self-harm. Um, we only use those examples to illustrate some of the challenges in, into the domain of uh, mental health um, and potential solutions, and we've ensured that all the examples are properly anonymized. So I will talk to you today about the context of social media and mental health support. Um, but I um, believe that many of the techniques that I'll show you today will also generalize beyond the setting. But I think the setting of mental health is a particularly important and present one today, uh, in part due to the very limited access to uh, mental health care today. Um, pretty much no matter where you look across the globe, mental health access is relatively poor. Uh, in fact, we may never have enough um, mental health professionals to take care of everybody um, given the capacity you have for training today. Um, and because of this access issues, because of stigma and other issues, lots of people seek out online kind of social media platforms to talk about mental health and to seek support. In fact, there's some um, platforms that are solely designated for people to uh, share what they're struggling with and, and uh, connect with other peer supporters. So often these platforms are also called peer support. And in this work, I'll show you a lot um, of work that we've done together with Talk Life. I'm showing you here a screenshot um, to a first approximation. You can think of Talk Life as maybe a Twitter-like platform that is um, solely for, for mental health support. Um, these platforms are used today by uh, millions and millions of people across the globe. Now, a key component uh, for providing particularly effective and successful support is empathy, which is the ability to understand or feel the emotions and experience of others. Um, and kind of consider an example where, uh, unfortunately, somebody feels that their whole family hates them, kind of one way to respond to them would be to say, I could imagine that this would make you feel really isolated, trying to interpret what the other person is uh, um, going through and engaging uh, with them. And empathy has been proven many times to have a very strong impact in mental health. In fact, studies have shown that these empathic interactions have very strong relations with positive outcomes, including um, building alliance and rapport. Uh, this is what psychologists call building a positive relationship uh, with somebody, and that um, is critical for, for mental health support in, in about any setting. Now, we have these peer supporters, and these are really amazing people that volunteer um, and, and try to kind of use their time and energy to support others. 
Um, but it turns out support is really challenging. And um, most peer supporters will be untrained. Um, and I will show you later some evidence that highly empathic conversations are actually quite rare. Empathy is highly nuanced and expressing empathy requires a lot of expertise and training. So you will find kind of lots of posts that are maybe a missed opportunity where people have the best intentions and, and want to support, uh, maybe saying, hey, maybe you should try talking to your friends. Um, um, that's often not considered a particularly empathic response because you jump to kind of solving the problem for somebody else before kind of acknowledging it or validating it and, and, and showing empathy. So across this talk, um, uh, we want to ask kind of the, the key question, how can we better understand and improve empathy in this peer support setting? And how could we turn more of these conversations online into more empathic ones? Um, because we have lots of reasons to believe that that actually would make those platforms more um, um, uh, productive and effective. And the key hypothesis underlying everything I'm going to talk today is uh, that peer supporters may express higher empathy if they get uh, some kind of feedback, which could be AI based. And I'll, I'll show you a reinforcement learning based uh, system at the end of the talk um, that we just evaluated in a randomized trial. Now, why is this actually quite hard? Um, for empathy measurements to be clinically relevant, they would actually need to match the clinical psychology construct of empathy. And it turns out that clinical psychology construct of empathy is quite different from what we sometimes uh, uh, colloquially say. Uh, it's a lot more than just positive sentiment or just an emotional reaction. And this literature would, for instance, highlight cognitive aspects of interpreting somebody else's feeling and exploring what they're going through. Turns out there is a lack of labeled uh, corpora that match this construct. Ideally, we would want to have explainable predictions to help uh, with learning and training. And we would want these suggestions that we make to be as actionable as possible. What can somebody do concretely to express more empathy? And uh, we interpret this as we want to make suggestions that are concrete, coherent language, which is kind of high dimensional, hard to generate. It should be context specific and personalized, but only show up when you need it. Um, and we want to keep this interaction diverse. We don't want to uh, kind of uh, turn everything into kind of generic robotic uh, template because this is a really meaningful human to human interaction that we want to keep at the center. So throughout this talk, um, I want to show, uh, tell you about uh, three different works that build on each other. First, I want to tell you about how we can measure empathy as expressed in, in text and then tell you what we can learn when we apply such a model to large online mental health platforms. Second, I want to uh, tell you about um, formulating this as an empathic rewriting, kind of a sequence to sequence task and a reinforcement learning based system that can give uh, feedback on empathy. And then lastly, I want to tell you about how we can use and build on the system and develop a human AI collaboration approach to expressing more empathy. Um, and I'll show you how we designed this type of feedback and, and then results from a very recent randomized trial that actually shows that um, 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 this has been quite successful, uh, which we've been super excited about. So let's start at the beginning and let me tell you about how we can actually measure empathy. Um, this took us a long time talking uh, to many clinical psychologists to really understand how for many decades psychologists have thought about empathy. And empathy um, in our framework is made up of, of three different components. First, emotional reactions that communicate the emotions experienced after reading a post. Second, interpretations that communicate the understanding of the inferred feelings and experiences. And third, explorations, where I will try to improve my understanding by exploring the feelings and experience of another. And we decided to differentiate um, all, all of these each um, on three different levels, essentially a threefold classification tasks of um, not expressing them at all, expressing them to some weak degree or expressing them more strongly, which typically means um, in a more context specific way. And I'll, I'll show you some examples now. So let's say um, I understand how you feel would be a weak interpretation. Um, everything will be fine, would be considered an emotional reaction, a weak emotional reaction. What happened question mark is a weak exploration. 
um, but this could also be more specific. So for instance, saying something like, oh, I think if that happened to me, I would feel really isolated. That would be a strong interpretation. I really, really hope things will improve for you as a strong emotion, emotional reaction. And I wonder if this makes you feel isolated, question mark, uh, would be considered a strong exploration. Now we can um, formulate these as um, computational prediction task. Um, um, two different ones. The first one is, uh, given a see what we call a seeker post where somebody shares what they're struggling with and a response, classifying this into weak interpretations, weak emotional reactions, and so on, would be um, a classification tasks, three separate three class classification tasks. And then we also want to do rational extraction, which is coming up with a segmentation that uh, finds these highlighted areas here. We want to, want to find the um, uh, supporting evidence or the rationale, which will help us um, later in generating different um, uh, training data, um, as well as will help um, with providing uh, explanations as well. Now for this, we collected a data set of 10,000 post and response pairs. Um, um, from both talk life and mental health subreddits. Um, it turns out right, like the, the whole problem is that this is really hard to, to label and annotate. So we went through very significant trainings uh, for, for hours and hours with freelancers that we worked through for a, a long time. And um, um, we were able to achieve a relatively high inter-annotator inter agreement of 0.69, which is much, much, much higher than uh, kind of comparable uh, constructs in kind of the mental health literature. And we very much um, attribute that to kind of uh, a lot of training. If anybody's interested, a lot of the data, as well as some of the, the all of the code and some pre-trained models are also available at this website. And I'll, I'll point, put up this link at the very end as well. Now, um, how do we how do we model this? Um, in the end, we um, we have this uh, seeker post and we have a response that we start with, and we want to predict both the label of the weak interpretation as well as a binary mask um, that does this rationale extraction. And what I'm going to show you is a multitask Roberta-based bi-encoder model where we first tokenize uh, the seeker post and response post. We put them to two separately pre-trained. Um, um, uh, Roberta based encoders, and we then fuse the two through an attention mechanism and then predict both this, um, this empathy classification label as well as the rationale. I'll briefly show some resu results and then we'll tell you what we can learn from all this. Uh, we were able to, in our data set, identify empathy with about 80% accuracy, 70% F1 score, which is of course higher than the 33% um, um, random baseline. Um, this was higher than various uh, baseline models we would all be excited about. Um, but most interestingly, um, and what I was um, sometimes what, I, what I'm generally uh, surprised uh, about is, is when something truly generalizes. And what we showed was um, that the way we measure empathy seems to generalize from talk life to, to Reddit or vice versa with virtually no loss in performance, which encourages us and, and uh, suggests that we capture a site independent empathy construct. So now what can we learn when we apply this to a large mental health platform? Um, talk life is the largest peer to peer support platform um, online. And I'll first show you some good news. Um, for instance, good news is that empathy, when it does happen, is really meaningful to talk life users. And for instance, we see that if there's higher emotional reactions or interpretations, you will see a higher uh, likelihood of that post being liked. Um, um, you also see that if uh, it's a strong exploration, there's maybe less likes, but you actually get a lot more replies. So these really kind of start conversations and keep conversations going. Um, and overall high empathy interactions are received positively by seekers. Even more so, um, when you express empathy, there is a, a higher likelihood that um, the seeker will start following you. So this is um, kind of our social media equivalent of a relationship forming, which is very well known in the clinical psychology literature. And empathy is always brought up as something important because it facilitates this relationship forming. And indeed, we do see that um, on, online as well. There, I see the first question. Uh, Chloe Joseph, thank you for starting us off with questions. The prediction task assumes that there are empathic responses. What if no empathic comments 
um, are in the thread, can this be formulated as another task to detect whether there is a response, uh, um, emphatic response in a thread? Um, so this classification task actually can do that. Um, essentially, the, the lowest level, so essentially for each comment in this post, um, you could make a classification. And if we say that for each of these three components of empathy, it's kind of the, the level zero, it's not expressing it at all. That would be equivalent with kind of this kind of single comment has no empathy expressed in it um, that we can detect. Um, um, and if, if that's the case for, for all comments, um, um, we, we, can, we can do that as well. It's certainly really important what you bring up. Um, and uh, kind of for the platforms and for, for the people running these platforms, for the moderators involved, it's a key goal for them that one, everybody posting there should get a response. Um, people, people talk about things that they're struggling with. So a lot in the platform design is actually optimized for people to get responses. And as your question suggests, ideally we would want those to be um, empathic as well. Now to some of the not so great news. So if you add up our three scales that go from zero to two, uh, you get a scale from zero to six. And it turns out that empathy is typically relatively um, low, uh, which is a one out of six. Um, and we were wondering, does it maybe improve over time as you get more experience? But we were finding, if anything, the opposite. And we sliced and diced this from, from many different perspectives. And we found that peer supporters do not sell for an empathy over time, if anything, is actually decreasing. Um, this was a little discouraging, um, um, but actually when we talked to our clinical psychologist collaborators, they were not surprised at all. And it turns out that there's established literature that even professionals that are trained without deliberate practice and specific feedback, they would diminish um, um, in their skills over time. So this has implications now for, for giving feedback. This is why we set out initially to figure out how to do empathy-based feedback. We can measure it, uh, but because empath uh, expect, um, empathic conversations are rare, maybe we can help by providing actionable feedback. See, there's another question by Alex Christiansen, um, somewhat unfamiliar with talk live, but is degree of empathy a better predictor of likes, follows than time of posting um, earlier and first poster bias. Um, um, I don't know the specific answer to your question, um, but we what, what we did see, which was very encouraging, was that empathy was correlated um, with kind of likes and follows and, and longer conversations and, and engagement in general. And those are kind of the outcomes that we have on this social media platform. Um, but it wasn't... Um, it wasn't a given from, from the beginning. So we, we tried very hard to, to very accurately reflect this clinical psychology construct of empathy. And kind of this is based on, on decades and decades in clinical psychology literature. It was developed from kind of people talking in person synchronously to their therapist. And we adapted that the best we could. And there was no guarantee that this actually matters to people on these platforms. Um, but what do these results show that they it actually does seem to matter, kind of however we, we chose to measure empathy was actually related um, um, to kind of positive engagement outcomes on this platform. Um, I, I will also say that empathy, um, not absolutely every kind of post needs to have an empathic response. Um, while this is a platform that is about uh, mental health support, you have kind of lots of general social media chatter about, um, I know, the the, the news and pop culture and whichever I know, music album just came out. So what we do in this work as well is first detecting uh, uh, posts where there's kind of a significant mental health concern. And those are the ones where we feel a lot more strongly that there, there should be empathy um, um, as a response. So uh, thank you again for all the questions. Let me now tell you about um, how we can um, built the first kind of systems that can start to generate empathy that we can then use, uh, use to give feedback. And we, we formulate this as an empathic rewriting task. So we take a lower empathy post and you want to turn that into a higher empathy post. So it's, um, here somebody says, I can't deal with this part of my bipolar. I really need help. Somebody might say, don't worry, try to relax. Is there anyone you can talk to? And this don't worry, um, 
can be challenging in the context of empathy. Clearly, the person is already worrying, and this can easily come across as invalidating. Kind of, what if we could um, rewrite this to, for instance, something like being manic is no fun. It's actually really scary. I'm really sorry to hear that this is troubling you. Um, um, and then kind of keep part of the rest of the response. Now, there's uh, significant challenges to this and, and why um, um, existing techniques don't work particularly well. Um, first of all, this can actually be a super simple task. For instance, if I um, change every post on the platform to, I'm so sorry to hear that, this must have been really hard for you. Uh, we would already do kind of better than average, but we would have this kind of very generic uh, template um, that really takes away from this meaningful human to human converse, uh, um, conversation. And it's very unclear whether this would be useful. In fact, um, um, this is unlikely to be, or it's obviously not specific to the emotions and experiences that were just shared. And in fact, some of our earlier work has shown that high diversity in, in responses is uh, affected, um, is, is correlated with positive outcomes as well. Now, this looks very similar to neural approaches of, of style transfer, but this actually requires changes beyond simple word transformations. So in a sentiment transfer, you might flip some adjectives from bad to good, but in this empathic rewriting task, we often have to add several new sentences, which, which makes for kind of a more complex um, language generation problem. And uh, for this one, we don't actually have any parallel data sets. Uh, creating one is expensive, um, and it requires domain experts that actually know about empathy and sufficient scale. See, there's another question. Um, users themselves can also be evidence for empathy. Wonder whether user profiles are used and how users' historical conversation can be used. Um, besides, um, the prediction can be extremely imbalanced in reality. Um, how can we utilize the data sets for open world empathy identification? Um, um, several great comments in there. Uh, we're so far not using um, kind of specific user profiles in this classification at all. We're just looking at text. Um, um, this kind of can also make it easier uh, to, to uh, kind of transfer across platforms. But at the very end of the talk, I will tell you about a randomized trial where we kind of analyze kind of empathy expression and how that changed um, kind of specifically user by user. Um, um, it is certainly kind of um, a, a class imbalance involved. I showed you kind of there's this average of one out of six. So it's, it's certainly not an automatically balanced um, situation. Um, but it, at least in the context of this platform, where um, it's really important to express empathy, and a little bit of empathy is often expressed, um, it, it's it's um, not the worst class imbalance I've, I've ever seen. So now let me tell you how we can um, start to give feedback. And this is an, a, a system based on reinforcement learning. Um, um, that we were also very happy with, um, uh, got the WW Best Paper Award last year, uh, which we're very thankful for. Um, so we built a system called Partner. And on a high level, um, we have this conversation between a seeker and a peer supporter. We will encode this in a state. And based on the state, Partner will suggest certain rewriting actions. And based on kind of the output of those, we, uh, that agent will get rewards for training. Um, I'll tell you now about each of these parts. The, the state will be made up by the seeker post, which is really important to be context specific and will be a fixed length contiguous span of the response post. We do this because response posts can be um, um, get longer and longer. And then one design decision we make here is that the edits and actions that we can be taken are either insert an empathic sentence or replace an existing sentence. So we have this sentence level um, action that we can take. So first, we will figure out what's the position um, that we want to do something. Do we want to insert or replace here? And then we need to generate a new a candidate sentence. So here we could replace being manic is no fun um, and kind of make this particular edit. And here we have the policy. So overall, how the policy network looks like is we have the seeker post and response post. Um, we encode those through a large scale pre-trained language model that is based on GPD-2. Um, we will jointly predict both the action and position to be taken and which sentence we want to put there. And then we can, based on that, generate the rewritten response. Um, here, we're kind of inserting something at position uh, zero. 
Now, most importantly, kind of what are the rewards here? Um, um, obviously, one report, uh, reward should have to do with empathy. So we will look at the delta in, in empathy, um, um, which is the scale between zero and six. Uh, we want to keep our text fluent, on which we measure through perplexity. Uh, we want to keep our response coherent. This means that kind of kind of sentences should uh, kind of not disagree with each other and kind of make sense together, which we train a separate model for. And lastly, we have this mutual information um, constraint that perhaps looks a little bit confusing at first, but it's actually super useful for specificity and diversity. Um, what this mutual information, for example, um, tries to achieve is, can I um, generate the original seeker post from the response? So if I have a response like, I'm sorry, sorry to hear that, which is kind of generic, I would not be able to really generate the, the original post. And, and this, um, this reward tries to keep uh, things as specific as possible. Now, when we evaluated that um, um, through both automatic metrics and, and kind of human um, evaluation, which I think is very important, um, I'll go relatively quickly over that, but you can ask me about it and you can uh, check out the uh, relevant papers as well. Um, but it, this kind of system improved both in terms of the change in empathy, uh, was higher in perplexity, uh, higher in sentence coherence and specificity, as well as diversity, which of course we encoded as the rewards. Um, it also had the lowest edit rate, which um, we were actually really excited about. We want to make the absolute smallest and minimal edits to kind of an existing response um, because we, we don't, kind of, it's, it's not very kind of nice to the, the support if you just cross everything out, you replace the whole thing. Actually making the smallest edits as possible um, uh, will, will kind of help us in the kind of user interaction that I'll show you in a few minutes. Just to show you here in terms of uh, the change in empathy, this is how many empathy points on this zero to six scales we increase. Uh, remember the average on the platform was about one. Um, so here you see baselines um, 0.4 and, and 1.2. Um, not everyone um, works actually particularly well. And our system overall is a um, 1.6 point increase or so 160% increase over the average response on the platform and about 35% more than the baseline methods. Um, what the warm start only here means is the same system um, without the RL component. And you see that that um, helps, but really there's a big difference in actually applying this RL-based training in addition. Um, so here the takeaway was that um, using these ideas, we can um, improve and kind of generate higher empathy text. Um, that is fluent, specific, um, relatively diverse, and has a, a low number of edits. Um, however, I think we, we also need to acknowledge that um, automated metrics can be kind of noisy, whether they kind of really capture in a lot of detail what we want out of those constructs is challenging. And therefore, we have had an additional human evaluation where we recruited six um, graduate students in clinical psychology that um, were basically just trained in mental health support and, and training. And because we know it declines over time doing this just after the training was a particularly good opportunity. And then we had this A-B testing where we would show them kind of um, one output of our system, one of a baseline, and we would ask them like, pick the one which is more empathic and which, which one you think is more specific. Um, and here in this figure, we kind of denote the preference on the x-axis. So what we're hoping for is to be kind of on the right hand side, um, which would indicate that these um, human evaluators uh, preferred um, our, our proposed model. And indeed, this is what we find um, um, both on, on empathy as well as specificity. Um, it also had the highest overlap with expert rewriting. So we would um, ask all these experts to actually write a new response and then check overlap in terms of blue scores um, which was um, a lot higher for, for our model as well. And then the last thing I want to show you here is that the partner model was the only one that didn't destroy empathy. It was already there. So because it was kind of really empathy conscious and was, was kind of trained with an understanding of um, um, measuring the empathy and trying to make few edits and kind of stopping as early as possible, um, if the response post was already empathic, it actually wouldn't change anything kind of back off gently Whereas um, even kind of very strong popular baseline models in NLP 
uh, that did not have this awareness um, would kind of try to rewrite it and usually make things worse. All right, so we were very excited about these results we were seeing, um, but there's many important considerations to be made and tested before we could ever kind of think about um, um, deploying such a model. So first we should be co-designing these systems with the stakeholders and the people for whom we're building these. And in this case, this is involves clinicians, mental health expert platform designers, and most importantly, platform users as well. Um, this is clearly a high stakes setting of, of mental health support and AI systems may not always be reliable, um, could plausibly generate feedback, which may be unsafe. Um, so it is absolutely vital to prioritize safety and design um, mechanisms that can minimize and eradicate unsafe instances. Um, we also need a careful design of user experience. Um, it's actually not obvious what kind of the best way is how to give feedback on empathy. How can we do that only when people need it in a way that's minimal and, and simple, yet maximally effective? Um, we also learned in working with people on this platform that uh, there's a big need for transparency and control. People want to know why one would make these suggestions. What are the benefits? Why, why should they be using the system? Um, why are they suddenly getting feedback? Um, and and um, we also want to make it easier for them to opt out of the system. And um, in our world, I, I'm sure we've all heard it, um, we, we talk a lot about human in the loop system. And I, I, I like to think about these type of systems a lot more as AI in the loop. Um, on a back seat uh, with human supervision, because in, in this setting, the, the meaningful interaction is really between two human beings. We want to keep it that way, um, but we want to provide help um, um, wherever we can. Now, um, while these considerations are extremely important, I, I think they don't take away from the fact that intelligent tools like this could be really useful. Um, and what I'll tell you about next is um, about kind of our first attempt at doing such feedback. Um, and I'll show you a little demo of how we designed it and then a randomized trial that we just finished very recently um, on how peer supporters from this platform perceive this uh, feedback and, and the effect it has. Um, it's another question in the chat by Alex. I'm curious as to whether you evaluated use of multimodal non-textual features within responses at all. Things like emoji use or GIFs to indicate sympathy or empathy, um, or would that simply not fit in the clinical definition of empathy? Um, you're hitting again on lots of exciting points. Um, in fact, we started with these clinical psychology scales that uh, certainly did not include uh, emojis, um, but they do include um, a lot of the multimodal aspects. So for instance, one thing I can do is to interrupt you in the middle of talk talking, if we have a, like a face-to-face -face synchronous setting and that's not very empathic and that would be part of those scales. And in our effort to adapt these scales to this online asynchronous setting, um, for instance, we're, we're not looking um, um, uh, for interruptions, but we're looking for other things. Um, however, in the setting, it, it's purely uh, text-based. Um, um, emojis are kind of sometimes used as, as part of these. Um, I think for the very uh, common ones, those, um, those would be part of the system. However, in terms of kind of multimodal, like using kind of just the right uh, GIF and, and images and so on, um, is, is, is not at all currently part of the system. Um, but in, in, in many settings, uh, also in a face-to-face -face setting, like my, my facial reactions and, and how I react to you um, um, certainly is part of it. Um, so I think this just highlights some of the challenges in kind of translating um, what we already know about mental health and, and clinical support to these new platforms that have a very different affordances and a different interaction paradigm. Um, let, let me show you um, how, how um, kind of the system worked in the end. Um, kind of putting in GIS um, actually doesn't work on this platform um, unless you kind of just link to something external to the platform. Um, but here I'll show you a couple of screenshots and a, a little demo of how the system worked. So this is basically how the system works in, in the control group without feedback. And I, I think this is often telling, um, we, we ask people to perform these really task, hard tasks but all we give them is an empty chat box. Um, and that's exactly what we see here. So for instance, somebody could now write out a response. Um, 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 I'm not 
kind of well-trained in empathy. So I might say something like, don't worry, I'm there for you. Um, there's definitely worse responses, no question, but this don't worry part um, is this aspect that easily can come um, across as invalidating because the person clearly is worrying and is writing on this platform. So here's what the treatment group would look like that has some feedback. So we will have this little pop-up here where there's somebody wants help with their response. Uh, we either do that kind of, if people want to click on it um, and kind of ask for feedback, we would give the feedback and we will also pop this up whenever people are pausing for a long period that might indicate that they're not quite sure how to respond. So let me show you how this works. Um, you'll also see this red flag button that we do to evaluate safety. So now I, I click on this um, uh, part here where I want feedback, and then we use a version of the model that I just uh, explained to you earlier based on reinforcement learning that makes a kind of a replacement suggestion and an insert at the end. Um, so for instance, here the model correctly identified, maybe it, it might, could be a good idea to replace the first sentence. There's also no exploration in here. So have you tried talking to your boss could be in, inserted at the end. So we have these sentence-based edits, um, and you can also reload feedback. Um, maybe the first feedback wasn't particularly useful to you. Maybe you want to see more example. You can do that as well. So now let me show you how um, the results of, of our, our trial. So we're basically comparing these treatment and control groups. Um, we, had, uh, we recruited 300 peer supporters from the actual TalkLife platform. Um, and of course, randomly divided them. And then we asked them each to re uh, write responses to 10 different posts, um, which took uh, about half an hour in, in total. I see the question in the chat. I'll come, uh, come back to it in, in, in just a few minutes. I, I think it's a great question. So the first um, result I want to show you is that in this kind of um, feedback-based transition, we see higher levels of empathy, about 20% more, whether you ask human participants or our automatic score. Um, I think this is very encouraging. Um, I don't actually think they measure exactly the same thing. The participants have a more kind of colloquial understanding of empathy, but clearly an empathic understanding that matters to them. And the right-hand side is our um, automatic score from the first paper I showed you, which I think is, is a lot closer to the kind of clinical psychology um, understanding of empathy. Now, we also asked people whether it was challenging for them to express empathy. Um, we know for most people on the platform that is true, and we actually didn't see kind of 20% improvements. We saw about 70% improvements in expressed empathy for everybody who found it challenging, which um, really is kind of a target group for, for a system like that, um, um, and we were excited about. And um, I do want to share a little bit about how people use the system. So first we kind of divided, we essentially clustered how people interacted with the system. And, and here are the clusters that we came up with. Um, kind of how often did people use the system? There were some people that did it always for every single time. Most people did it often, but some people also did it only once or, or even never. In, in terms of those that often used it, um, they often used it in different ways. They could use it directly by just clicking insert and replace. Um, they could use it indirectly. So I don't actually click insert, but then I write something that's um, um, very similar to the suggestions made. And um, I was really excited when we, when we saw this kind of cluster emerge, because those are people that aren't necessarily just clicking uh, insert, replace, replace, send, um, um, but they actually kind of think about it a lot and, and they use this feedback as, as kind of creative inspiration. And then lastly, kind of some people also um, ask for feedback multiple times, um, potentially because the feedback the first time wasn't particularly good or because they want to learn more. And um, it is interesting um, that the more you use the feedback system, the higher the level of expressed empathy actually is. So the people that did not consult um, this feedback at the lowest level of um, empathy on par with about the average on the platform, um, but kind of the more kind of as you go from left to right, the more you use the system, the higher levels of empathy were. Um, um, this was not randomized, so there could be some se selection effect. And the very last thing I want to uh, um, share with you all is um, um, results from kind of a, a post um, post trial survey 
where um, again, we were quite encouraged to see that about 77% kind of asked us to actually deploy the system on Talk Live. 60% um, um, said that the feedback was actionable and helpful to them in supporting others. And one of the most, uh, I think, exciting things to me personally is that 69% of participants reported self uh, increased self-efficacy. So they would say, I feel more confident um, at writing supportive responses after the study, um, which really is an amazing thing, kind of this, this training effect um, um, is, is really important. Um, and, and one thing I actually forgot to say earlier is that our, our control group that gets no feedback actually did receive empathy training. So prior, prior to the study, everybody, no matter in which group they were in, got kind of a, a kind of one page kind of um, kind of non real time, just in time contextual kind of empathy training. We would tell them what empathy is, we would show them different examples. Um, this is training that doesn't currently happen on most of these platforms, so we wanted to raise the bar. Um, and if we kind of evaluate this kind of fancy, uh, real time contextual reinforcement learn based feedback, is there actually any place for that? Um, like, what if you could do it so much simpler and cheaper? Um, so everybody on the platform already had that type of training. So showing that there's kind of this increase in empathy and that people actually feel more confident in writing um, resp um, these responses um, has a lot of potential and suggests that we could use this training uh, system for, for training in, in this and perhaps other settings as well. So with that, uh, let me summarize. Um, um, I showed you that empathic conversations are crucial for effective online mental health support, but that unfortunately currently empathy is relatively rarely expressed online. Um, I showed you that our work proposes uh, new tasks and, and several data sets for building tools that can be used for facilitating empathic um, conversations. This was an empathy framework for how can we measure that and a data set um, um, with uh, related classifications. I told you about this empathy, empathic rewriting task that essentially is, is kind of just done by, by a machine in a sequence to sequence manner, but is successful at, at kind of taking something and turning into in a similar conversation that's more empathic. Um, I showed you different models, and then I showed you in the end how we can put this together um, in, in terms of tools that can give intelligent and actionable feedback to users. And um, this last randomized trial suggests that this collaboration um, on, on empathy may be effective. And um, um, we're very excited about this and currently working with this Talk Life platform to deploy this on their platform, which um, 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 kind of one thing that's very important there that I didn't share a lot about in, in terms of time, but it really has to be at the center here as well, is there uh, a lot of safety and moderation um, uh, considerations have to go into this and, and the system will be integrated in kind of a larger moderation system that they already have um, where of, of course we, we only may want to make things better on the platform um, but we did actually learn from our trial that only in two out of 2000 cases or so kind of empathy was actually flagged because it was um, uh, concerning for safety but two is also way too often um, and um, kind of we're working on improving these systems uh, to allow even kind of such open domain generation to be only uh, safely used in the setting. Um, with that, um, again, thank you to the organizers. Thank you to everybody here on the call, to everybody asking questions as well. If you want to learn more, uh, you can go to my group's website um, or, or this particular empathy website here. Again, um, uh, thanks to everybody on the team that made this happen and our uh, lovely funders. Um, and uh, now uh, let me catch up to all the questions in the chat and, and kind of please, uh, please uh, keep all your questions coming. All okay, right. and thanks, Tim. Thanks yeah. for your presentation. Yeah, uh, now we can take uh, questions in, uh, in either just speak, speak yourself or in the chat. Thank you. See, so I, I tabled a question a little earlier. I apologize for, for the delay. Um, but I thought it was a very good uh, kind of general question. Uh, Kath asks, uh, does all response text can be written to empathy? I'm curious what kinds of text cannot be empathized. Um, so I, I'll give you kind of a, uh, a partial answer that I, I think is, is really not particularly satisfying. In, in some sense, you can always kind of remove 
uh, the entire response, replace it with something that expresses more empathy. So from some kind of not very empathic, simple understanding, in, in principle, the kind of model and, and task has the power to, to kind of always, always say something empathic, um, where kind of a very generic example is, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I, I, I hope you'll, um, things will, will kind of get better soon. Um, however, um, I think the context and original um, kind of see what we call the secret post also matters. So for instance, if it just tells me, hey, like here's the new Taylor Swift album or here, I know, like, can you imagine what happened at the sporting event? Um, kind of, I think not all contexts even need empathy. Um, and um, I, I think we, we in, in a way, we thought about it a little bit more in the inverse of your question. Like, what are the contexts where we're really certain that there should be empathy? Where kind of uh, uh, like counselors and, and clinical psychologists, they would say like, no, like we like this is exactly the place where you need to respond empathically first, and then we can think about other things. And um, this is often related to um, people sharing something vulnerable, people um, kind of uh, self-disclosure, people sharing something for the first time, um, and uh, kind of sharing some kind of considerable mental health cons uh, concern or, or kind of a negative experience that they've had. And as we all know, there's kind of lots of other things online where I think it's, it's perfectly fine for there not to be necessary em em empathy. Um, but in those specific cases, and those are the ones we focused on. And by the way, when I said one out of six average empathic response, this was on the subset where we felt really there should be an empathic response and not just kind of general social media chatter um, where I think we could have very different standards in, in a very reasonable um, way. Um, thank you for that question. Go on to the next one. That is Luke. Um, very interesting about the system. I'd love to use it. Does the RL based method compare with style trend, sentiment transfer in the evaluation? Also very curious how that this system can be deployed on controversial uh, on controversial threads on popular posts. Um, so first of all, we make um, all the all the code and some pre-trained systems public. Um, we're not allowed to um, kind of we have a data license agreement with TalkLife that doesn't allow us to share um, TalkLife posts. However, we also use Reddit with the system, so we have some data that's labeled online. All of the code. And we're willing to share everything that we can share publicly with anybody who um, um, also kind of has a data uh, li a license with TalkLife. Um, so so an anyone can reach out to them, um, um, negotiate a data license, and we're very happy to share anything we ever created um, uh, with you um, in, in this kind of then legal setting. Um, does the RL-based method compare with style and sentiment transfer? So, so I think it's a very similar task, but it has some distinct challenges. So um, with kind of, especially sentiment transfer, I think is, it tends to be simpler. We, we tend to just kind of flip a few words from something negative to something positive or, or, or vice versa. Um, there's other forms of style transfer that are slightly more complex, um, but relative to kind of all style transfer tasks, um, I think this empathic rewriting often makes more substantial changes than just flipping a few words here and there. Um, um, often I have to add kind of long full sentences, maybe multiple of them. So um, I, I think it presents some unique challenges. And we did see in, in the evaluation that, um, let me see whether I can scroll back fast enough here. We did see in the evaluation that a lot of techniques um, um, that are popular in, in, in this setting, um, uh, as here on the site, they don't quite work as well. Um, curious how the system can be deployed on con controversial threads. I'm not 100% sure what you mean here, but if these are kind of th threads that are um, where things aren't going particularly well, could this be used to diffuse the situation? Um, I'd certainly be excited if that were the case. Um, it's admittedly not what we focused on. I think a lot of this is focused on people that already mean well, that just need better tools to be able to act on this. Um, there's a lot of them, which I know I, 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 um, makes me feel very positively about the world. But of course, we also know in the setting here that uh, there's a lot of uh, controversial 
um, um, and more intense threads um, on the internet. Uh, there's great research on that as well. Um, and I, I think it's a, it's a great direction for future work in, in terms of how um, uh, either increasing the empathy and kindness in these interactions could maybe help us um, from, from um, fueling these uh, threads to begin with. Um, another question is how to let more people use the sympathic rewriting system. Many people do not want their text to be edited. Um, um, you're right. Uh, we also saw this in, in this uh, randomized trial. We didn't force anybody to use the system. Um, and there was, um, I don't know, maybe 8%, I, I want to guess, uh, of, of people that just didn't use it at all. Um, so this is this is, is definitely a thing, and um, we also we interact a lot with this platform with, with people that design or moderate these um, these platforms, and kind of they said from the beginning like if if we deploy anything it has to be transparent like we we'll have to explain why the system is there kind of where it's coming from what what the goals and intentions are what the potential benefits are but also then allow people to opt out like not everybody wants this and I I, I think. Um, we, we need to respect that. Um, on the other hand, we were very encouraged by a lot of people actually using the system. A lot of people said that it was actionable and helpful. A lot of people kind of used it multiple times. Some people used it in more creative ways where they don't just copy and paste what we what we suggested, um, 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 but kind of uh, use it as more indirect inspiration. Um, um, in terms of how to let more people use it, um, kind of we, um, many of us kind of uh, pay for, for deep use to do the work that we do. Um, um, it's not the cheapest model to run, to have kind of this RL-based deep language model to, to do these generations. Um, it's maybe not a problem for the largest uh, industry giants, um, but for mental health nonprofit organizations, um, this is also challenging. Um, they're, they're super excited about this. And as I, I mentioned, we're working on deploying this, but we're actually also working on one, um, how can we make these models more efficient that we just kind of um, can uh, make them kind of energy and time efficient and, and serve more people with the same amount of resources. Um, and two, um, we don't know yet kind of what the right dose of feedback is. Do I need to give you feedback on every post and every second post and every 10th post, every 10 days, every month? Um, and that will also kind of allow us to think about how we can get most of this effect um, while scaling this up to as many people as want to use it. Um, then Kath, oh, uh, reposting a question that wasn't answered. I, I, I apologize if I missed something in the chat, but I, I appreciate you bringing that up again. Um, can the empathic rewriting results be detected by your first part, parts method? Um, I, I can say definitely yes, but I also have uh, have to explain that we used kind of the models in the first part to measure empathy in the first place. So um, we, we do think that the kind of the classification model from the first part of the talk um, is is um, let me see here right the right slide as well. So specifically, this model here was used um, among many others in this reinforcement learning based system. So it's the one that classifies how much empathy do I have previously? How much empathy do I have afterwards? What's the difference? We get a reward for that. Um, so uh, unsurprisingly, the model learns to optimize for this metric. And then um, uh, almost by definition, the model can kind of recognize this as well. Um, um, the, this was kind of one reason um, this is one reason why the human evaluation, I think, was so important as well. Um, in, in some sense, we're less surprised by seeing the empathy um, go up. It's maybe a little encouraging, um, but it could also be, I don't know, maybe it's the model is overfitting to the, the mistakes that the, the classification model make. Um, but in, in, in both the, the middle paper and the last study I showed you on the human evaluation, we saw that also kind of experts and, and peer supporters felt that this um, the output was more empathic and was more specific. Um, second question is, how can empathic rewriting be applied um, on social media? So um, um, in, in some sense, I, I think the, the rewriting, I, I like this AI on, the, on a backseat scenario where um, really many of these interactions are between humans. They're meaningful exactly as such. 
Um, so I, I like thinking about applying these in a setting where people request um, um, for that to be the case. Um, and we can kind of kind of make it transparent that kind of these, these tools are available to them. But in many ways, I think about like in social media, we always start with these empty chat boxes, even though we have such kind of rich and often challenging interactions uh, to deal with, how can we give people more support than that? Um, and in, in many ways, right, like this Talk Life platform, I think is very much a social media platform. It's maybe particularly focused on, on empathic support. But if you think about the, the Facebooks and Twitters and, and Reddits of the world, kind of there's lots and lots of similar groups, lots and lots of similar interactions. Um, so I think that the empath empathy part specifically um, can, can be applied in, in such settings. Um, and even beyond that, I, I think that um, this, this general technology of, of giving more feedback on writing, or like we're all familiar with, I don't know, maybe getting feedback on the spelling, and maybe the grammar on our writing. Um, this work very much focuses on empathy, but there's so many other aspects where you could help people uh, give feedback as well. Or like um, some of us work on, on maybe detecting uh, gender bias in, in, in job descriptions um, and, and, and uh, improving on that. And, and there's so many other examples. So I, I also hope that this um, basic technology that we're developing here based on, on language model on reinforcement learning on the right interaction design with uh, humans that this could also generalize. Next question is the evaluation of rewriting should include how user behaviors can be positively impacted. Uh, are they feeling better or do they do, some, uh, do they not to do something bad? Um, this is difficult to do to be numerically evaluated. Um, um, absolutely, if I like the um, I know the proof is in the pudding. Um, so in this last randomized trial, we very intentionally. Um, did not perform this on the on the real platform just yet, uh, because there is many concerns, there's safety concerns. Um, so what we did is we essentially we kind of copied real issues on the platform and worked with the actual peer supporters, but kind of put them into the sandbox environment, where then whatever they write, even if it's horrible, like we will never show this somebody else. Um, and, and this was really important, I think, to, to build this um, carefully from the ground up. Um, um, but for instance, what this does not allow you to do is kind of what's actually the, the, uh, the impact on the original support seeker. If that person had really gotten this empathic response, how would their world or, and kind of their, their feelings now be different? I think this is a, a super important question, right? Like this is kind of the a very central person that we care about in the setting and why we think about empathy in the first place. And that was not evaluated yet. Um, in the middle part, I showed you some of the, the kind of correlations when empathy does happen. There's more likes, more responses, more follows, which are all very encouraging. Um, but I, I think a clear next step, and, and we're working on that step right now, is when there actually is, kind of if the system intervenes on the peer supporter, which we also did intentionally, not on the support seeker, what are the indirect but very important effects on, on the peer seeker, uh, on the support seeker? How does this kind of um, change the trajectory over time? Um, um, I, I do think some of these things can be numerically evaluated. Um, we also intend to run more surveys on the platform to check in with people how they're doing to see whether we can kind of detect such differences, but it's certainly a very central and critical um, aspect. Um, and I, I, I appreciate all the questions. Um, so, sorry if I missed them on the chat again. I have this tiny chat we know you on the side. Um, all right, uh, what's next? Uh, Ted Wong asked, in addition to rewriting, let, to let empathic conversation be more impactful and more positive to people, should we create some quote unquote bots that automatically generate empathic responses? Is it doable technically and or ethically? And I, I, I appreciate that, that you also uh, include both of these components in, in your question. Um, so first on technical feasibility, um, so in some sense, like we showed that this rewriting can work, uh, it kind of increases empathy. Um, one thing I didn't show you in the, in the randomized trial, um, we were interested in the authenticity and like um, whether people think kind of this is an authentic human written response or not. Um, and we actually, if you look at the paper, there's an archive paper already out um, and the actual paper is under um, review. Um, 
um, we also evaluate an AI only version of the system, which basically just applies this empathic rewriting without human interaction. Now, in terms of um, similar to the earlier question, um, this system kind of was trained on increasing empathy and it, and it does so on average pretty well. Um, so I think it's technically feasible. Now, what you did see is that um, there is kind of a, a decrease in authenticity. So if you wanted to try and fool somebody that this bot response is actually a human response, um, um, I think it works often, but not as, like, as often as if it's a human AI collaboration. Basically, um, if it's a human written response, let's say it has kind of a very high um, probability of being recognized as human written, I know 80, 90%. It, all, like, it basically is on the same level for a human AI collaboration approach, which is nice that it kind of keeps that human human element at the center, but it, there's a significant drop with the AI model. Now, I think the ethical part is, is quite difficult. On the one hand, right, like if there's somebody who does not get an empathic response at all, maybe they'd be better off with kind of a, um, a, a kind of bot written response. I, I think that's a conversation to be had. And in fact, there's some communication researchers at, at Stanford that um, are, are studying uh, around Jeff Hancock um, at Stanford who are studying deception in the setting. Um, now it doesn't have to be deception, or like we could be transparent and say like, hey, here's this talk live bot or um, kind of clearly designate here's a bot response, but at least kind of you, you get a reaction and, and maybe that's positive as well. I think that's a little too early to tell, but I, I think given how, how few mental health professionals we have and how bad mental health access is, I think it's an important question that we have to ask ourselves whether um, if the alternative is not getting any support at all, um, maybe using technology for this, um, even if it's not quite as perfect as the best kind of human therapist on the planet, um, maybe it, it's kind of still worth acting on this. And, and you'll see kind of lots of startups in, in this setting. There, there are kind of startups that, that um, do not deceive, but kind of say clearly, hey, you're interacting with the bots, uh, but this bot can still, still help you. Um, okay, okay. As now, um, be because um, the web cameras will have the plenary sessions uh, uh, five minutes and five minutes later. So we need to um, end uh, for your talk. And uh, we are very thanks uh, for Professor uh, Tim Asof's uh, great talk. Uh, I believe that uh, all the participants really enjoy your talk. And uh, also thanks for answer all the questions and uh, provide so many interesting and uh, uh, useful insights uh, for all uh, participants. Thank you. Also, thanks again for Professor Kaisu's talk and uh, we really enjoy it and uh, we're happy to have you uh, as our keynote speech. Thank you. And uh, uh, let me uh, quickly close uh, the social NLP workshop this year and uh, especially for these editions and the web conference. And uh, I would like to share with you more information on Social NLP Workshop. And uh, uh, in fact, the Social NLP Workshop will also uh, uh, have another editions at NACO, NACO uh, 2022. And uh, uh, this year we, we are at the 10th uh, uh, anniversary special event. We will invite all of the past keynote speakers uh, from the past 10 years. and. Uh, and uh, invited come back uh, to share their recent research. Uh, now we have uh, a list of conference speakers this year. We hope uh, all of you can uh, participate again uh, to the uh, social NLP workshops and the uh, editions uh, for uh, uh, the NACO uh, this year. Okay, this is our information for promotes and we will share this information also on uh, social media. Okay, uh, this is the end of the social NLP workshop uh, at the web conference. Uh, thanks all of you again for all of your participations and also thanks for the uh, wonderful keynote speakers. Thank you.